And thank you, Jamie, for putting up with us and pulling off yet another successful year of Coverloo. So thank you. All right, now we get down to business with housekeeping. So uh, you might have noticed on the website all the emails that we have been sending you relentlessly throughout the weeks out there. We do have a code of conduct for the conference and the community at large. So that is on the website. We strive to have Code for Live to be a safer, inclusive place for everyone. And we ask everyone to, again, refresh yourselves as to what is in the Code of Conduct. Now, if you have any questions about the Code of Conduct, or if you encounter something that might be a violation of the Code of Conduct, Code for Live Conference does have duty officers, and these duty officers are tasked to answering your questions, as well as helping you through the reporting process if there is a violation. Today's duty officers this morning are Mark and Bobby. So Mark and Bobby are in the back. They're waving right now. If the AV folks can bring up the uh, pictures of all the, all the duty officers. So you're looking for Mark and Bobby there for the morning. In the afternoon, we will have a new set of duty officers and new set of faces. Now, you might have noticed that uh, the photography uh, policy has three colors of lanyards. And we are now with one colored lanyard, and, well, two colored lanyards, black and green. Uh, unfortunately, our lanyards are stuck in shipping. They are in Midwest somewhere, but they should be making their way to here, hopefully by the end of the day. And we will let you know when the colored lanyards are here. Now, just to give you a refresher, uh, we have three lanyards. The first lanyard is a patterned green. That means you are free to take my picture. You don't need to ask as long as you manage to get my good side. Um, for yellow, it means please ask before taking my picture. And red means do not ask don't even think about taking my picture. And we ask that everyone asks for consent if you're going to be filming or recording someone. If someone's wearing a black lanyard, that is our default for the time being, please ask to take my picture. If you see someone with a weaved black and white lanyard, that is a duty officer who is on duty. And once we get our lanyards uh, from the Midwest, there will be ribbons for indicating who is on staff. So these are the people who can answer any of your general conference questions. And now for orientation. So this, this building's big, so bear with me. So restrooms, we have options. So if you go up one level, there are restrooms. If you're looking for gender neutral restrooms, they are on the main lobby uh, right next to Robert's restaurant. This year, we are very happy to have a quiet room. It is the VP, VIP room, which is behind this room. So if you go through um, stage right or left, you go through behind the stage, there will be yellow arrows on the floor and signage leading you to the um, quiet room, and it's free to use for any attendee if they need a quiet space to take a break from the conference. For those of you who are not familiar with quiet rooms, these are meant, th these rooms are meant for rest, and they are not meant as a quiet place so you can look at your work email and work. So rules are posted in the room itself, but they're also posted on the conference website. And speaking of accessibility, we do have a few more announcements on those. So live transcription, as in, pre as in uh, previous years, we do have live transcription of the conference. The uh, link is on the general website. I can say the link right now it is 2020archive.1capapp.com forward slash event forward slash code for lib. I think you got that. Um, it's also on the website. Uh, okay, and you see, this microphone right here, and you see there are microphones scattered throughout the audience. We ask everyone to speak, in the, speak with the microphone. 
to ensure that everyone, including the speakers, the physical attendees, the live streamers, and live transcription service can hear what is being said. There are instructions if you're curious about how to effectively use a microphone on our website under the accessibility section. And if you have any other accessibility questions, we do have a few ways you can contact the accessibility folks. We have a email address, codeforlive.accessibility at uh, gmail.com. Or you can ask a conference organizer if you have additional needs. And now we get to the general thank yous to all the sponsors. Uh, thank you for providing the funds available so we can pull pull off yet another successful Cultural Lib conference. And specifically, we want to call out the Adamendium sponsor, Library of Congress, and the Diamond sponsor, Black Light. So thank you to you all. <laughs> Remember, each time you clap for a sponsor, we can get another coffee break funded. <laughs> I think that might be something for next year's conference. All right, so uh, for a good portion of you, this is your first Code for Lib. So we'd like to give you a little bit of overview as to what to expect at the conference. Maybe you don't think of yourself as a coder, or maybe you never worked in the library and you're trying to figure out where exactly you fit. There are some, these are some of the things that we do. Most of us, are here representing a wide range of skills and interests, but coming together around libraries, museums, and archives technologies. Code for Lib is not an official organization. It's more of a collective. Things get done by people taking the initiative. We also like to share, and one way that we share the cool stuff that we're working on is through the conference. With that said, there will be a lot of information thrown at you in a very short period of time you will be mentally exhausted before the end of the conference. If you need to take a break, do so. Just decompress outside the conference room, go to our quiet room, or try a nap for lib. And second thing, there will be things that will go over your head. This is normal. This happens to everyone. No one is an expert in everything. So don't worry that you don't know every single little thing that's mentioned in the presentations. And while the presentations are going on, we also have the back channels. I'd like to point out three back channels in particular. For those of you who are on Twitter, we have a conference hashtag on the screen. We also have the IRC Code for Lib channel. This channel is active year round and it's especially active during the conference. And yes, we do have the obligatory Slack channel. If you haven't signed up for the Slack channel yet, the uh, link is on the screen and is also in the emails that we sent you last week. They are act these back channels are active during the presentations, but they're also active outside the presentations, which leads me into the social aspect of the conference. Yes, Code for Live does have a lot of craft beer fans. There are also double minuses and double pluses, and a debate between how you pronounce Code for Live versus Code for Lib. By the way, Code for Lib. There are things that you might hear in conversation that you might not understand. If you run into anything that you don't understand, just ask. And for those veterans out there, if you see a confused look after you say something, that's probably a good sign that you need to explain. So, heads up. The great thing about this conference is that there is a diverse range of interests. We have lots of gamers, beer drinkers, musicians, joggers, tea enthusiasts, bakers, and more. So if you go to the social activities page on the wiki, you'll find information about the Wednesday night game night tonight, as well as uh, the do-it-yourself events page for events throughout the entire conference. No matter what you're interested in, beer, tea, games, running, there's one thing that folks have to do during the conference, and that is eating. So Code for Lib likes food, and food is a good way to meet new people and network. At breaks and meals, try to sit and talk with different folks. 
or paint the various back channels to see if anyone would be interested in joining you for a meal or beverage run. If nothing else, just take one of the appetizer trays at the conference reception on Thursday and offer folks food. Disclaimer, do not actually try to take the trays at the reception. A last reminder, the website and wiki are great resources for updated conference information and for social events. Keep an eye out on the social events wiki page if you're looking for things to do with other people. And with that, I welcome you to go for it. All right, we are almost on time. Uh, we're gonna go ahead with our keynote speaker. So we have Chris, Chris Berg, and she is the Director of Libraries at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, where she also has oversight of the MIT Press. She chooses to believe that libraries can and should promote social justice. Please join me in welcoming Chris to the stage. Is it going to turn any slides off if I close the laptop? Excellent. Okay. Cool. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. I'm grateful you all are here on a holiday. Um, I know it's a, not a holiday everyone celebrates, um, but for me, the day pitchers and catchers report is like serious <laughs> holiday. So, you know. <clears throat> um, so anyway, I, um, I have a couple of confessions to start off with. Um, one, I know I'm overdressed for this conference, um, and, and I have to apologize that I will have to leave shortly after my keynote um, once the Association of Research Library folks learned that I was here in DC, no good deed goes unpunished, and there's a committee meeting um, at 21 DuPont that I have to attend after this talk, um, which actually um, we're talking about sort of the future of professional development initiatives for, the, for ARL and especially for ARL directors. And so it, will someone please remind me in the Q&A that I, I have a question for you all about that. Um, so yeah, I appreci would appreciate that. Um, the other, the other uh, confession I have is you'll notice I don't have slides um, and I was planning a a sort of informal talk. Um, I've never been to a Code for Lib. The closest I came was I dropped in on the local Code for Lib in, uh, that was at, at MIT, um, I guess it was two years ago. And so even though I'd been given all the information about what this was gonna be like, I still pictured a classroom, about 30 people, I could say a few things and then kind of come out from around the podium and sit down and we could just chat. So I'm still hoping that we can do that a little bit. We'll see, it's, it's a little harder with spotlights and, um, and an actual stage. Um, <clears throat> so that was one of the other confessions. Another confession is I don't really like keynotes. Like the whole idea that like one person would stand up and like dispense wisdom to the crowd just is really like goes against every ethos I hold dear. Um, you know, it's like way too sage on the stage kind of thing. Um, and I guess especially, you know, the idea that I would have much to say to this crowd um, is a little intimidating. Um, I've, I've never coded for libraries. Um, in fact, the last time I wrote anything that even looked like code, it was, I think, 15 years ago, and it was SPSS code to run some statistical analyses on dissertation data. Um, I'm pretty sure that my current tra career tra trajectory, that's a hard word to say in front of a crowd, um, means that I will never code for libraries. Um, so I'm not a big fan of keynotes. I don't have expertise or experience in the work that most of you all do. What the heck am I doing up here? Um, but you all pick your keynotes, right? And I just, like, 
I kind of had to say yes because I figure we've got to support democracy wherever we find it these days, <laughs> you know? Um, the, other, the other real reason, I, I mean, there are lots of reasons I said yes, um, but there are so many people that, who, who's, who I love and respect who are huge fans of this community or active in this community, and so I just, you know, it was really an honor to be to be asked to, to talk here. Um, so <clears throat> I struggled a little bit about like what would I talk to you all about? Um, and I do, in fact, believe strongly that libraries can and should be leveraged in the service of social justice, but I've given that talk in a bunch of different places. Um, and my, my approach generally when I'm asked to give a talk is to try and think very carefully about what what I in particular could bring to that specific crowd I'm being asked to, to talk to that maybe they wouldn't get um, from some other speaker they might have selected. Um, and here, the, the thing is, I've been at MIT now for three years, <clears throat> and ever since I've had that attached to my, uh, uh, my name, people want me to come and talk about gravitational waves and quantum physics and artificial intelligence and 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 I'll do that in a room full of ARL directors, and they'll believe that I know what I'm talking about. Um, oh God, they're probably watching on the live stream. Um, not you, not you who are watching. Um, but but I'm not gonna try and fake y'all out about things I don't know as much about as other people who are more capable than me. Um, and I thought about um, talking about. Uh, MIT's Future of Libraries report and our vision uh, about building an open global platform um, where we would offer abundant, equitable, interactive access to information. Um, but the truth is, uh, open global platform is just a metaphor when I talk about it, and it's folks back um, at MIT like Heather and Helen and Matt and Osman and Mike and Jeremy and Richard and Andromeda and Sol, those are the ones who are actually building in stuff. Um, and by the way, they're looking for a department head. Just shameless plug, uh, MIT is looking for a digital library engineering team department head. Um, and we are especially keen on increasing the number of people of color and white women in library tech. So if you are someone you know might be interested Feel free to chat me up afterwards. Okay, so <clears throat> what am I gonna talk about? What could I bring to this crowd that you might not get from others? Um, and again, e even though this is a bigger crowd in a different setting than I had uh, mistakenly and through my own fault envisioned, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna try and keep my prepared remarks pretty brief, um, no slides. Um, and, and I wanna have a pretty lively q and I, I don't think, and I may be wrong, but it doesn't seem like you get a whole lot of library directors giving keynotes here. So I wanna make sure that I give you all time. So start thinking now, you know, everything you ever wanted to ask a library director but were afraid to ask your own, feel free to ask um, when I'm done here, whether it's about what I talk about or not. <clears throat> okay, so, um, what I do bring to librarianship is a sociological lens and a feminist perspective, right? And I've done some talks on bias in technology, and I've done plenty of talks about lack of diversity and equity in libraries. Um, and given everything that's going on in the world right now, I was tempted to give a really ranty, like all caps kind of um, keynote about all the problems in tech and the lack of progress in creating welcoming and inclusive cultures. Um, but I've done that, others have done that. Um, plus, I just came from ALA Midwinter. Were any of you there? Were any of you at, um, so Juno Diaz, I get to say, my friend Juno Diaz, because um, he's at MIT, um, <coughs> he gave one of the auditorium talks at ALA Midwinter. And, <laughs> whoo! He didn't hold back, not one bit. It was, uh, I would encourage you to read about it and also they're gonna uh, release the video soon, I think. Um, so so he, you know, he said things like, a profession that is 88% white, that's us by the way, a profession that, librarianship, a profession that is 88% white 
means 5,000% agony for people of color, no matter how liberal and enlightened you think you are. He said this to a room full of librarians. Um, and he also said, and I get to say this because I'm quoting, <clears throat> he said, we need to, he, we, he said, libraries need to have a fucking reckoning about the pain we cause and that we need to do some hard work on decolonizing our organizations and our professions. And he's not wrong. And what goes for libraries goes for library tech too. Um, but he said it better than I could. Many of you already know that. And if you don't, then having some liberal white lady, even one as queer as me, telling you again isn't gonna persuade you. So, <laughs> thanks for the laugh. Um, <laughs> So, so we've been talking for a long time, I actually, I actually think, about the problem, about we've got a lack of diversity in tech, lack of diversity in libraries, lack of diversity in library tech. And we've critique, critiqued the culture, culture, and we've done some things, and this community especially has done some things, right? We've got codes of conduct, yay. Um, we do better at getting diversity in our speaker lineups. Um, but that progress hasn't been nearly enough, not on gender, not on race, not on queer and trans inclusion, just basically not on creating truly inclusive cultures where members of marginalized groups are recruited, retained, mentored, promoted, genuinely provided with equitable opportunities to contribute, to thrive, and to lead. And look, I get it, this is a community that does many things right. Code for Lib is a community that does many, many things right. Um, from what I've heard from people I know, this is a community where people feel included. Included, They feel safer. Um, sexism, racism, transphobia, ableism, and the like are not tolerated. Um, in fact, I sense that many folks from marginalized groups consider the Code for Lib community and this conference to be a kind of haven. Um, and that's great except that it's not okay that folks need a haven from their own work organization. Like, that's not okay. So instead of the ranty keynote, which I guess I just gave a part of, um, with all these examples of the problems, I'm gonna spend a little time just sharing um, what I know to be some solutions, because um, we sometimes don't get there. We, we talk about the problem and that's super cathartic and validating, um, but we don't often get to the real solutions. Um, and what I'll share is from some recent research I've been reading, um, some stories that I've heard, and then some of what I'm gonna say is just me trying to use the privilege that I have as a library director to say some things that, that others have been saying but don't get this kind of a platform um, to speak um, on and maybe don't feel as safe saying. Um, so let me start with the assumption that we all agree that lack of diversity is a problem, that we want cultures that are welcoming and inclusive. Um, and I'll also throw in, um, I'll also note that um, there's gonna be a lot that I'm gonna say uh, in the next few minutes that's primarily meant for the white guys in the room. Um, for some of you, what I say may feel like uh, I'm just preaching to the choir. Um, I hope instead it's gonna feel more like I'm equipping the choir, that's the goal. <clears throat> um, I'm focused, and I'm also going to focus mostly on building inclusive cultures, right? Because as much as we uh, want to throw up our hands and say our diversity problem is a pipeline problem, and I'm so sick of hearing that, how many of you are sick of hearing that? Yay! Okay. Um, <clears throat> right. There's retention data that tells us that we have problems with toxic work cultures and unfair practices that drive women and people of color out of tech as well. And the I'm, I'm gonna quote some stuff from a report that I read recently, and uh, it's called the Tech Leavers Study. I don't have slides, so I'll slow down and let you, I tweeted it out earlier, and somebody out there is gonna look up the link and tweet it out. Um, it was put out by the um, Caper uh, Center for Social Impact. Um, uh, led by a researcher named Allison Scott. They've got some really sobering stats on the degree to which unfair treatment, discrimination, stereotyping, and bullying in the workplace are the key reasons why women and our people of color leave tech work, either tech jobs in technology companies and tech jobs in um, non-tech companies. So some stats like this. Among the people who leave tech jobs, 
Unfairness or mistreatment is the leading reason. It, it, people are two times more likely to leave their tech job because of unfair treatment than because they got recruited away for a better job, right? Um, women of all, this won't surprise the women in the room and hopefully it won't surprise some of the men, women of all backgrounds experience uh, and observe significantly more unfair treatment than men. LGBTQ employees were most likely to report bullying and to experience public humiliation and embarrassment. Man, we gotta do better. Unfairness, discrimination, and crappy treatment. Um, that's not in the report, I just, that was sort of. Um, drives turnover, it's as simple as that. Um, and, and it sucks more for underrepresented people of color and for LGBTQ folks. And 57% of the folks who've left tech jobs would have stayed and this is where we can start talking about solutions, they would have stayed if their prior employer had addressed workplace environment, had, had addressed the workplace environment, and had created a more fair and inclusive culture. So let's talk about things we can do to improve those cultures so that we can move that needle. <clears throat> and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some individual things we can do, some work group, sort of small group things we can do. This is the sociologist in me coming out, do different levels of analysis, individual, small group, and organizational or leadership. <clears throat> so at the individual level, like it's actually not enough to simply not be blatantly racist, sexist, or homophobic. Like that's a minimum, it's necessary but not sufficient. It's the more subtle forms of stereotyping, discrimination, and harassment that take their toll and are shown to lead to lower retention in tech jobs for marginalized folks. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna go there. One thing that the men can do and white people can do in mixed race interactions, I'm gonna go there. You gotta stop with the mansplaining. You gotta stop. Like, just stop. Stop doing it in person. Stop doing it online. A and what I mean is this, and I know that term is loaded for some people. Deal with it. Um, like, if you have power and privilege in a situation, and if you're white, and if, especially if you're a white dude, you have power and privilege in a situation, then for the love of baby unicorns, stop giving unsolicited advice and critique. Just stop, just sit on your hands for a minute. For a minute, hesitate. Please. <laughs> I don't know who that was, but I love you. Whoever laughed, thank you. Um, like, just practice some restraint. Like, let yourself imagine that sometimes your voice doesn't actually have to be heard. Like, And what I mean is this, don't be the guy who reads the blurb for Sophia Noble's brilliant new book, Algorithms of Oppression, and decides on the basis of a couple of quick Google searches that his research invalidates hers, and then tweet it out. Don't be that guy. Please don't be that guy. And, and don't be the guy who responded to the article Beth Sadler and I wrote a couple of years ago called Feminism and the Future of Library Discovery, who, uh, who tweeted out that, man, only people who don't know anything about creating search tools would write an article like that. <laughs> now, those of you who know Bess might know that she knows a thing or two about creating search tools and has spent maybe a minute or two doing exactly that. So look, I know it often feels like other people really need to hear what you have to say about a topic. But if you're a white guy, I'm gonna ask that you consider all the evidence we have about how women and people of color are talked over, ignored, and shut out of conversations, and think about the fact that the airtime you take up may be the airtime that could have gone to a woman or a person of color and maybe just decide that you don't have to weigh in on everything, and you definitely don't have to explain things to marginalized people. <sighs> that felt good. <laughs> okay, so what can you do? Well, there's research that shows that to break down stereotypes, 
what men and peop other people with privilege and power in situations can do is to publicly vouch for the women and the people of color that you work with. And this is something anyone in a leadership position or other position of power and privilege can and should do. Men can do it for women colleagues, white folks can do it for colleagues of color. A and vouching for someone simply means that you talk up their accomplishments and skills, especially in a group setting um, that is predominantly male and are white. You use your power and privilege to vouch for others. It's really the opposite of mansplaining. And so, some examples. Vouching for someone might look like this. Hey, Tom, have you met my colleague, Safia? She's an expert on algorithmic bias in search engines. She's just published a book based on years of research. That would be one way to vouch for someone. And it's been proven to decrease the amount of um, sort of interaction, um, the way that it's been shown to decrease um, the discrimination and prejudice and silencing that that woman would experience in that setting. So it actually, it works. Like it works, guys use your privilege. White folks use your privilege to do this. Um, so another example is, you know, this is Bess. She has tons of experience developing open search tools Actually, she was instrumental in the initial development of Blacklight, by the way, for a random example. Um, Bess is the per I, I have to mention Bess because she's the person who first uh, turned me on to Code for Lib in this community. Um, so shout out to Bess if you're watching. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so another thing individuals can do to improve culture and make tech more inclusive and welcoming is to be an active bystander and ally. So, you know, to borrow a phrase that I'm not fond of in other settings, if you see something, say something. So, if other men are talking over women, jump in and just say something as simple as, whoa, hold on, dude, I want to hear what Kathy was saying. That, it's that simple. Um, if a white person is repeating something a person of color said and is getting credit for it, just say, hey, you know what, that sounds a lot like what Burgess was saying. Let's let Burgess explain it. It's really that simple, but it requires that those of you with privilege act, actually act. <clears throat> so there are things we can do at the small group, sort of work group level two, right? Just like all politics is local, all culture is local. Well, not really, but there's some, lots of visible manifestations of culture are local. <clears throat> Man, I've said this part before and I always get, people don't like it. So there's research that shows <laughs> that workplaces that are plastered with stereotypical tech or nerd guy images, so like Star Trek posters and toys and stuff, that has a negative impact on women's likelihood of pursuing tech work and of staying in tech work in general, and definitely of staying in that particular work environment. And man, people love them their Star Trek posters. Um, and even the women, right? So the, a lot of the women will say, but I like Star Trek. And in, in, uh, in sociology, we call that selecting on the dependent variable. The, the women who stay and are comfortable in a situation are comfortable with the kind of culture that's in that, are often cof comfortable in the culture that's, that's in that situation. It's the people who aren't there that may have left because of this culture that doesn't seem welcoming. So all you gotta do, replace the Star Trek posters with travel posters. Right? Don't name your projects or your printers or your domains after only male figures in Greek mythology. <clears throat> Just generally avoid the, the inside nerd jokes um, because that kind of thing reinforces the stereotypes about who does tech. And that stereotype is in fact a male nerd stereotype. And uh, I'll tweet out a reference to a, a, a study a colleague of mine, Shelley Carell and Allison Wynn did where they studied, they, they surveyed women and men in tech companies in Silicon Valley about what the prevailing stereotype is about a successful tech worker. And big surprise, it's you know, a male, nerdy um, guy who works lots of, lots of hours um, is a stereotype. There's some other pieces to the stereotype. And, and how well a person feels they fit that stereotype has huge effects on how they rate their own work, 
how, um, how likely they are to feel like they're being successful. And these are, these are women who are in Silicon Valley being successful um, and, and whether they'll stay in, in the job or not. So, you know, we, we, have to, we have to take active steps to break down that stereotype. We can't just roll with it. We have to pay attention and, and be active. Um, you know, I also want to urge you to pay attention to the kinds of informal socializing you do at work and in those sort of liminal spaces that are kind of work and social and kind of get blended together, right? So, you know, if, if all the guys go to lunch together and not the women, stop doing that. I mean, just stop. Um, and if the guys go to lunch and they talk about women, then really, really stop doing that, okay? Um, and if there's a core group of guys who go out for beers after work just because you're all friends, that's kind of okay. But if you also talk about work and make decisions, that's not okay. You got to be more aware. You've got to be more accountable to each other for being inclusive. And if you keep inviting people to do the thing that you like doing, you know, that some core of you like doing, if a bunch of you like going out for beers afterwards and you ask the women in your, in your work group to join you and they keep saying no, then do something else that they might like doing. <laughs> I mean, it's not that hard. Don't shrug it off and say, well, we asked. You know, try something else. Um, <clears throat> or find a better time for the informal team building that, that would work for everyone. <clears throat> and look, if some of you out there are like, man, I don't want to give out my beer time with my buds, right? Some of you are like that, so I, that's fine, but then admit that, your beer time with your buds might mean more to you than building an inclusive work culture. Like, just be honest with yourself then. <laughs> All right, so now that I've told you give up your Star Wars posters and your happy hours, um, the rest is easy. Um, <clears throat> so there's some organizational level suggestions. And again, I urge you to read this, this Tech Lever study um, that the Caper Center put out. Um, and I'm sorry for the sniffling, it sounds even worse amplified. Um, so, so what they found was that, that individual diversity and inclusion initiatives um, are not nearly as effective at increasing retention of women and people of color as a comprehensive integrated strategy and approach. So some elements of a comprehensive um, approach would include, you know, obviously top level commitment to diversity and inclusion including stated values, goals, and, a, and an approach that treats diversity not as something over here that's nice to have, but that treats diversity as a strength, right? Leadership needs to truly understand that diversity isn't just nice to have, but that diverse teams are more effective and better, right? <clears throat> Training is important. Um, by itself, it's actually not so great. But training in a range of topics, including, yes, unconscious bias training, but also bystander intervention training, training on understanding and preventing microaggressions, um, preventing sexual harassment, how to be a trans ally, a whole set of training topics are important in a comprehensive approach. <clears throat> Another element that often gets left out is a commitment to gathering data and looking at it and using it. Right, all kinds of data, hiring data, retention data, data um, internal promotion data, and survey data that is designed to uncover people's feelings of inclusion or exclusion across demographic groups. And it's important here to, again, you know, we look at the hiring data, we look at retention data, sometimes we miss the informal stuff, right? So when we look at, at at when we make hiring decisions and promotion decisions, and many of us in this room have, have sat on committees where we do that or have made them, um, we look at whether you got picked for like project manager or team lead or you know, you get picked to do these informal jobs in these ways that, that the selection process is not formal. And, and that's what then sort of adds up and accumulates and if it's, you know, if it's the same people who are always getting picked for that, then it's the same people who are always getting the next promotion as well. So pay attention to that stuff. Um, another piece of a comprehensive strategy is to develop and maintain some kind of confidential channel of communication so that when people experience bias and discrimination, 
it can be expressed and it can be handled. And then commit to um, auditing your practices, right? Audit your management practices, the hiring, the promotion, compensation, internal work assignments. <coughs> so <coughs> one of the really, really important findings about diversity initiatives is that training alone is not very effective, right? In fact, in some circumstances, we know that unconscious bias training, for example, um, can, and sexual harassment training too, there's some research on that, it can backfire. Right, because the white folks get resentful, the men get resentful, and marginalized folks are sort of put in the spotlight and scrutinized. So training is important, but it can't stand alone. And if you think you're done doing your diversity uh, project by doing a one-shot unconscious bias training, think again. <clears throat> okay, um, so I made a bunch of suggestions. I didn't put them up on slides, but I will um, send the text out. I will put, uh, make sure the text of this talk is available with links to the studies that I've cited. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna sum up um, some of the points that I tried to make. So uh, instead of mansplaining, I'd ask you to vouch for women and people of color. Use your privilege to intervene when you witness microaggressions and silencing. Pay attention to the small group culture that you're creating and that you're contributing to in your workplace, right? I'm sorry, but ditch the Trek posters um, and such. Be intentionally inclusive in your social activities. <clears throat> Take a comprehensive approach to diversity and inclusion that goes beyond the one-shot training and includes clear leadership. It includes data, accountability, and communication channels. <clears throat> and I think what what we really all need to commit to is that we monitor progress on diversity and inclusion the way we monitor progress on any technical system or our technology project, right? We check the progress regularly, we pay attention to the data, we look at milestones, and we're transparent about it. So I'm actually like really excited about the potential for new library technologies and technical approaches um, you know, for social justice, I'm excited about approaches that would empower our users, that would open up access to more collections, allow for transformative uses of library content. I'm really excited about that. Um, but I'm afraid that if we don't make a commitment to progress on our diversity and inclusion challenges, then I really believe that what we create and what we build will not be as good or as useful to the range of users and uses that we should be serving. <clears throat> so that's, um, those are my prepared remarks. Um, and I don't, and I don't, um, I don't like keynotes <laughs> and I don't like traditional Q and A's. So again, like I really was picturing that I could just like walk around and sit on the table in front of a small classroom and we'd have a little chat. Um, and we can still, I won't come around cause I'll use the mic. Um, we can't do that. Um, but uh, what I'll say is this, if anything I've said has inspired a thoughtful comment, go ahead. You don't have to have a question in mind. I'm actually one of those people who's okay if whatever I've said inspires a comment that is thoughtful, because um, I'm not gonna pretend that I'm up here with all the answers, um, so, so comment away. Um, if you wanna ask a question entirely unrelated to what I've said, that's okay too. Um, the only thing that I would ask is that we make sure that women and our people of color who want to speak get a first shot at the mic. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ricky. And I can't really see because of the spotlight, so <laughs> I'm not even sure where the mics are, to be honest. Oh, okay, that makes it easier. <clears throat> Chris. Okay, um, you talk about the pipeline issue. Do you have some uh, solutions for that? Or things that you guys have tried at MIT? Um, no, we haven't cracked that code yet. Um, I can tell you that I know um, for librarianship in general, um, there is a new program uh, that ARL has just launched. So um, where we're reaching into actually um, 
undergrads. Um, it's called the Digital Inclusion and Excellence Program or something like that. I'm sorry, Mark, if I got that wrong. Um, where we're trying to recruit from undergraduates instead of waiting until people are actually in an MLS or an advanced degree program. Um, but I actually think that that's, um, the, the pipeline problem is in some ways a, um, a red herring. Um, that there, there are, you know, we, we say that and then we say that there aren't uh, enough qualified um, women and people of color um, for our jobs, but they're out there. We're just not, cert we're not advertising in the right place. And, and I think we're not attractive enough because of the problems that I've talked about. Hi, uh, hi, Chris. This is Kate Dival, and I just want to first say you did ask me to give you a challenging comment or question. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, shoot. So, so you made a lot of comments about calling out uh, white women and people of color, which yeah. my white woman self is feeling pretty good here, but my queer disabled uh, donkey butt is a little bit kind of put off, and okay. it's one of those where. Diversity is much easier to talk about and show when it's the visible signs of it. Yep. But the same stigma issues uh, really become pretty stronger when it's, uh, you know, you're talking about the more invisible hidden ones that you just can't look at. I mean, well, and you know, you self admit you do kind of flaunt, uh, you know, visibly your own queer self, and I celebrate that. But it's a challenge there, yeah. and it's something we we can't leave the non-visible uh, diversities behind. Thank you, and I did, I did ask for that challenging, um, I, I'm not sure I heard a question in that, but the challenging comment, and, and you're 100% right. I think that we, um, uh, we spend too little time talking about other kinds of marginalization and the, the kinds of, um, as you called it, invisible um, uh, identities. Um, and you know the, it's it's a vicious cycle, right? Because um, what I what I um, my bias is to try and bring data to the talks that I uh, give and to the solutions that I offer. Um, but most of our data doesn't look at these invisible kinds of uh, 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 marginalization. So um, you know maybe it's a, maybe what we need is a call for that kind of of data. Um, because we don't, we do a really lousy job with, um, you know, with, with uh, uh, ableism, uh, I mean, all kinds of queer and trans issues, we do a lousy job with, um, yeah, you're 100% right. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, Chris, I want to just interject. Our friend Bess Sadler has a question. She's, she's asking. Hi, how Bess. Do we, yeah, hi, Bess. <laughs> how do we get HR directors and department heads to hear what you're saying? <clears throat> wow, that's a good question. Um, and I, I think what, I, what I'll say is this. Um, I, I, um, look, I know I've got, a, 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 I am visibly queer, um, but and I've got a position that gives me a fair amount of privilege and gives me, a, um, why am I blanking on the word, a bully pulpit? Is that the right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I try to use it, but I'm going to send this talk, send it to your HR director <laughs> and tell them Chris said so. I mean, I don't, I, you know, um, I, I think that what it, what it takes is um, those leaders that are willing, those directors and HR directors that, that are really committed to us making progress and to doing the hard work and, and maybe pissing off the establishment. Oh God, I keep forgetting that I'm alive, being live streamed and tweeted probably. Um, <laughs> uh, I think those of us who do have to be very vocal um, so that others can point to, well, you know, I I'm okay with people saying, well, MIT's committed to doing this and holding our feet to the fire, by the way, because I'm not up here pretending that we have cracked this code because we have not, um, but it, you know, but feel free to point to examples of places 
that are doing it. And I, you know, I'm kind of hoping that it will be that weird sort of healthy competition that might happen. Um, but that's a great question, Bess. And I, I you know, I think that um, <laughs> I feel like I, in a room full of what is it, f almost 500 people. I feel like I'm having a one-on-one -on -one with Bess right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to find your out there. I believe, and I hope I'm right, that uh, in every library there is somebody in leadership who is an ally on this issue. And, f you know, find them and use that um, to crack the door open. You asked for a reminder that you had a question for us. Oh, thank you. I do have a question for you. So I'm going to have to leave here and go to a, uh, some ARL committee me meetings, and it's a meeting of, of a new group called the ARL Academy, and they are so trying to devise sort of new kinds of professional development for um, ARL directors and our staff, right? So my question for you and, and it, you can take either parts of it. The one I'm most interested in is, what kind of professional development do you wish your library director got? What topics do you want them to be smarter about? And you can tweet me that if you want, but. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm Kate Doey, I'm at the University of Maryland, and I am the person with an inappropriately loud laugh. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> I loved it. it so um, my question, because I think that, you know, as you said, like, I'm tired of this being a conversation about the pipeline. And I'm thinking about, um, you know, I have been to a lot of terrible management training <laughs> that is entirely geared towards, you know, and sorry, this is real talk time, white dudes. Yep. Um, <laughs> And, um, and I've found that that is deeply problematic to sit in a management training session at you know, an institution where they say, as a manager, really, you should be focused more on things like baking cookies for your team, right? And that sort of advice, which I've received. You can't hear me rolling my eyes. <laughs> if that becomes an animated GIF, I'll be happy. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so my question slash comment is really like, how does that need to change for women, for people of color, for you know, differently abled individuals, for gay and lesbian, transgendered, et cetera, people? How does management training need to change? Is that yeah. kind of the question? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, um, and I don't, again, I'm not the person up here with all the answers. Um, but, but your specific example reminds me of, uh, of what I think is sometimes a very simple intervention, which is, <clears throat> you know, we, and, and I did it, and Kate called me on it, right? We often talk about things, and we do training, um, and we imagine a, 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 an audience in mind. Um, and we imagine that we want to tell people to do this thing differently than they're doing it now. Um, and, and no matter how inclusive we try to be, we're always leaving someone out. And I think a simple intervention is just to, is, is a first step is to name it. So I tried to say, you know, a lot of what I'm saying is for you white dudes, right? And so, because I've given talks before where I've talked about, you know, you need to stop mansplaining and the women are, are like, yeah, duh. Um, so I, I think some of it is, you know, I don't think it's a bad idea um, for some people who are managers to um, develop a more caring approach to leadership, right? But I think we have to be very explicit about the fact that those approaches um, manifest differently for different people and are received and evaluated differently and interpreted differently for different people and can be used um, to devalue the leadership skills um, of women and feminine presenting people, right? So I don't know if that answers your question or not. Um, this is Naomi Duche. I have a little bit of an answer to that. So oh, good. I'm just going <laughs> to jump in. It's, it's, a, it's a weenie answer, but if it's safe to do so, give feedback on those, on yeah. those training materials and tell them why you're offended or why you think it's not appropriate, and if, if at all possible, tell them how you think they can make it better. Um, 
Also, if you have the opportunity to create your own materials based on actual research, not just chatting, <laughs> take it. Um, That's great. I'm, I have a small opportunity myself right now to talk about uh, gender and IT. I don't mean this minute, I mean in another context. And I'm really going to try to to not just like talk about it in general terms, but look to that small group of people and say, here's what you can do. And so I'm extremely appreciative of Chris's talk and the lead on that article cool. um, so that I can say, here's some concrete research-based things you can do. Um, so that would be my best suggestion. And do find that safe place, whether it's yeah. your university ombudsman or, or maybe there's somebody in HR who will listen and maybe there isn't. But yeah. don't give up looking for that person if you feel safe. Yeah, thanks, um, thanks for that save there. That's our old Stanford colleague there. Thanks for the save. Because um, I was about to mention the ombuds person, and, and um, yeah, it shouldn't, it shouldn't take that kind of persistence. Let me just put that out there. It shouldn't take that kind of persistence. Um, but if you have the energy and, and um, can do it, that's, you know, keep, keep trying. So I was uh, taken with your comments about a safe back channel and mm. have been in the kinds of tech environments where really toxic things happen. Yes. And there was the institutional policy that there was a safe place to go talk. Um, and I'm a white dude and I've got a little gray and I'm kind of dad. And, um, and I found myself- Me too, except in, the dude part. In a, in, a, in a team environment saying, you know, and if, if, there's, if somebody has a problem, I'd love them to talk to me. And I'm like, oh my God, I sounded exactly like that other place. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if you have thoughts about how to make that credible in your organization, um, particularly in the dynamic where you're the white guy. Yeah, so I mean, I can tell you that some, some things that we are doing at MIT, I mean, one is make sure that people know that if there's an ombuds office, make sure they know about it and that you make that not some big scary thing. Like that that's just normal, like that is a resource that is out there and it's okay to use it and I'm about to get the hook. The, the other thing that we have at MIT is we actually have an anonymous email that goes to our director of HR um, I don't know how it's set up, but it, it goes to her. She doesn't even know who's sending it. Um, and she sends it to the appropriate leaders to answer, and I get to see all of them. Um, and if we need to anonymize the content of the email, we do, and then leadership responds, or the appropriate person responds. And right now, we have it set up so that all of the, all of the comments and questions um, and the answers and responses are on a public website. So, I've, you know, we're, we're, we, the leadership, are accountable. Um, we're about to switch that so that there's a, um, wow, that's a really big red time's up. Um, we're about to switch that so that there's an option for somebody to say, I want to make this comment or, or complaint, but I don't want it to be up on the website. Um, they just want to let leadership know that something's going on. So I think that there are ways that you can set up those channels um, and it will depend on the culture of your organization in terms of who, you know, who that goes to so that the people in the organization really do have some trust in it. So. Thanks very much. And I, I will stick around for, um, till, till I guess the, is there a break now or? Okay, I will definitely stick around through the break. So if anyone has any other questions they wanna ask more privately. Thanks so much. Thank you, Chris. And finally, we got you here at Code for Live. So thank you again. So we have a break until 10.15. Yes, there will be caffeine. But for those speakers who have not signed a speaker release form, you need to go to the AV table in the back of the room. If you are speaking in the next talk slot, we want you to load up your presentations. So I'll see you back here at 1015. You want to be back in the room because we are going to do our first round of giveaways. See you then. All right. and. Uh, so we're gonna do a little bit of an exercise. So you got that caffeine, but you need a little bit of uh, 
movement to get that caffeine going. You may have seen people wearing different colored t-shirts and different designs with the Code for Lib logo. And so, I am curious if you are able to raise your hand, who all is there, who all is attending Code for Lib annual for the first time? Clap. <laughs> all right, and now we get to the who are all old in the room. How many Code for Libs have you attended? Is this your second Code for Lib? Your third Code for Lib? Your fourth Code for Lib? Five Code for Libs? Six Code for Libs? <laughs> wow, we have very few six years this year. Seven Code for Libs? We're starting to thin out pretty pretty thin. So, eight code for libs, nine code for libs. We got one, we got one. Ten code for libs. Woo! Decade. <laughs> Did we get silver for our 10th year anniversary? 11, 12, 13, 14. Karen stands alone, as far as I can see, if I don't see a hand up anywhere else. All right, now we're off to the presentations. So, our first talk is by Hank Sway, From Problems to Solutions, a case study in building the right thing. Hello, everybody. I, too, will start with a confession or two. I think I'm a little overdressed for this event. Um, and I do have slides. That's confession part two. Uh, but that's mainly to keep me on track, I think. So sorry about that. Um, so thank you for your votes, uh, for voting me up here. Uh, it's an honor to be here, a somewhat nerve-wracking honor. Uh, but I'm very glad to, glad to do it. And uh, why don't we get started? So my talk today is about the importance of understanding user problems in the software design process. And I'm going to use OCLC's mobile app for student workers as a case study. And I better start my slideshow. There's the mouse. Great. OK, so why did we build a mobile app for student workers? We were determined to create an app that would meet a need for a defined set of users, but we didn't know it would be student workers at the outset. In order to figure out what to build and for whom, we had to know more about who works in the library and what their challenges and opportunities are. This open-ended approach was a pretty big epiphany for me. It's sort of like when you put on your favorite sweatshirt in the morning and uh, you head into the office and you're, you know, because this is code for lib, we all wear our sweats to the office, and uh, your kind colleague uh, tells you that your sweatshirt is on inside out. That's pretty much the realization I had. I realized that many of the software development projects I had worked on in the past had a completely inside out approach. Rather than listening to the needs of end users and, de and developing creative solutions to their problems, we have focused nearly 100% on improving internal tools and processes with little regard to how this impacted the customer's experience of the library. In other words, as fashion forward as this sweatshirt is, we were firm that we wanted to deliver a right side out app. I'm gonna walk you through our user-centered approach to creating this mobile app, which empowered us to be confident in the ultimate solution. This slide outlines the process and I'm gonna say a little bit more about each step. I should also note that we are under a pretty tight deadline from OCLC leadership to deliver this app about a year from start to finish. So it was critical that we move through the process quickly and efficiently and that each step set us up for success in the next. 
As I mentioned, we didn't walk into this project knowing we were designing for student workers. We allowed ourselves to be challenged and inspired by what we learned as we selected the right who for this app. Being clear and deliberate about choosing our who was also a big aha moment for me, and it was key, it was key to the success of this project. Remember, we didn't want to create an app just to create an app. We wanted to solve a real problem and do so well. So we discovered our who by using a few different techniques and resources. First, a persona identification exercise we conducted in 2016 showed that student workers were a role we hadn't paid a lot of attention to in the past. We had sort of lumped them in with full-time staffers but with less permissions to do things in whatever systems. We also looked at the Many Faces of Digital Visitors and Residents report from OCLC Research, and that identified that there were varying levels of literacy, engagement, and comfort in dealing with an online system or set of systems amongst potential app users. Third, we conducted a, many internal surveys of OCLC staff, uh, many of whom are librarians, and this opened our eyes to the frontline perspective of student workers and their common questions, concerns, and challenges. So, once we suspected we had an interest in student workers, we further narrowed our problem set by referencing problem statements that emerged out of a 2015 OCLC member forum. We learned that libraries need to first, do more with less budget, second, cater to the quote, personalized boutique needs of millennial patrons and student workers, and those are, those are their words, not mine, as a quasi-millennial myself, and third, uh, we learned that libraries need to track usage of their materials uh, particularly physical materials in the stacks, on the floor, and outside the building. These problem statements cemented our interest in student workers. With limited staff and budget, it's a challenge to, for managers to train student workers, some of whom may only be around for a semester, some of whom will be around for their entire academic career. We asked ourselves, how could our app empower the student worker and ease the manager's training burden? I should also note that our primary focus was student workers in the US, and it's certainly true that tasks assigned to student workers do vary internationally. We also wanted to make sure that our app solved a problem that was uniquely suited for a mobile device. You can do a lot of things on a mobile device, but if your app is designed to do something your users would rather do on a larger screen, I'm thinking about that doctoral uh, literature review here, it's unlikely to get the adoption rates that you're looking for. So tasks performed on the go in the library stacks were a natural fit for a mobile solution. And as it happens, particularly here in the US, these tasks are often assigned to student workers. As millennials, this group is also sensitive to the shortcomings of paper-based workflows upon which many of these tasks are still reliant. So, we knew our primary who was the student worker, with a secondary or supporting who being the student worker's manager. We knew that the primary tasks for the student worker would have something to do with tracking materials. We also know, knew, and here I'll dip my toe into the technology side, that OCLC's World Share Management Services circulation APIs were tantalizingly close to supporting mobile pull list functionality. So we continued down our journey of discovery by running contextual inquiries, uh, try saying that five times fast, at seven libraries in the Midwest region. These CIs allowed OCLC staff from product management, user experience, and development to shadow student workers and their managers as they performed their common tasks. Along the way, we dug, on, dug into not only these tasks, but also what were their goals, what were their challenges and pain points? Did they have ideas of a world with less paper and more real-time updates? This was a great exercise for everyone involved, and it was another aha moment for me as I learned about new methodologies for understanding our who. We held team-wide debriefs after each session, so everyone had a baseline understanding of the common tasks, goals, challenges, and pain points. As a team, we agreed that our focus was to empower the student worker in the stacks as they retrieved items for circulation pull list fulfillment and for soft check-ins, that is, uh, gathering usage statistics for materials used in the library building.
We also studied both analog and digital solutions, including other mobile apps that libraries were using in this space. Other apps we looked at were built for library staff, but not specifically geared towards student workers. They were either focused on the patron or on full-time staff. This put us in a unique position to, un to empower an underserved population who often works only two to four hours at a time. Student workers are not patrons. However, they've seen uh, behind the mysterious veil of the CERC desk, or rather because they've seen behind the mysterious veil of the CERC desk, but they're also not as informed as a full-time staff member. So with this in mind, we knew that our app needed to be snappy, intuitive, in, uh, informative, but also engaging and professional. We began by proposing a high-level sitemap of tasks a student worker needed to achieve, and that was realistic for us to build into the app given our timeline. We identified that soft check-ins and managing the pull list were both within range from a user interaction and a technical feasibility perspective. These were the two most common tasks assigned to student workers, to the student workers and managers we spoke to. This is when we began implementing our feedback gathering process at the high level sitemap, wireframe, and interactive wireframe stages. It was very important for us to know that we were on the right track with our app. And the best way for us to do so was through feedback gathered from student workers and managers early and often. We had first held a focus group with the managers to confirm that we had selected appropriate common student worker tasks. When I say we, I mean that the session was led by our UX team and included product management, developers, and QA engineers so we could all ask clarifying questions. We walked the managers through wireframes of the app workflows, and we were able to ident identify a few major gotchas before we even touched code. In the next round of design iteration, we performed usability testing on an interactive wireframing prototype. prototype. Using the tool Axure, we created a website loaded on a mobile device that mimicked app behavior. It was designed to uh, vibrate and ding on command. One of our UX researchers set up shop at The Ohio State University, and the rest of the team watched the tests remotely via WebEx. The students were asked to perform pull list and soft check-in tasks by picking up the device and scanning the barcode of a stack of books. If the focus group caught the first 80% of problems, the usability test caught the next 15% or so. This was aha moment number three, I couldn't believe that we had addressed so many issues without even showing users anything that required actual code. Finally, we had a complete pilot program where team members traveled to the Palney libraries in Indiana with preloaded devices to get them up and running on the app quickly. At the end of each student worker's shift where they used the app, the student worker submitted a survey describing their successes, failures, and suggested improvements. So all told, uh, at the end of a two-week period, we had received somewhere between 50 and 60 responses. And this covered, I believe, the final 5% of finesse-type issues that we felt we needed to address before we were comfortable going live. We also learned about some specific configuration needs for Palony's group circulation system and some nitty-gritty issues about things like barcode types and characters we needed to support. Who would have thought that barcodes sometimes contain slashes, but turns out they do. So this is how we got to our app, which we named Digby. Collaboratively building a mobile infrastructure was also key to the success of this project. The identity management and web service security teams at OCLC were key players in this. We also had to add new features to the WMS circulation APIs to support the pull list and soft check-in workflows. But having already defined what problems we wanted to solve, with this app made the scope of the CERC team's work very clear. So yes, API first is absolutely the right approach to take when building a mobile app, but its true value is only realized when informed by a clear understanding of user problems and the scope of your project. This model will allow us to rinse and repeat the same iterative process as we go back to our users and decide what new features to add to the app will be able to support new use cases that hadn't even been thought of when building the initial app. 
So that's perhaps the most exciting development of all. Now, I'll begin wrapping up by bragging just a little bit, but I think it's clear from some of the testimony we, we received, such as this uh, quote from Lynn at Pepperdine on the screen, that our approach really helped us solve meaningful problems for libraries. Both student workers and their managers loved the app during the pilot, ranking at 4.5 stars overall. Just to share one anecdote, during the pilot, we conducted training sessions for the student workers. And a few days in, a student arrived for her shift, um, having not been to one of the training sessions. So uh, her manager told her that they were participating in this, in this pilot for a new mobile app, and she showed her one of the devices. And you know, a few seconds later, the student just said, OK, I get it, and headed into the stacks to do her job. So I think that's really the true sign of our hard work paid off. And this kind of success wouldn't have been possible without the expertise of our UX design development and product teams, uh, including, of course, my uh, colleague and uh, 14x Code for Liber, Karen, who's over there. <laughs> um, so. All right. Uh, so at this point, I hope you're asking yourself, how can I replicate this success at my library? Now, I realize you probably aren't going to replicate this process exactly back at your institution, but here are my three big takeaways from this project, those aha moments I referenced. I think these will help steer your next project in the right direction, and I'll certainly be applying these towards future projects at OCLC. My first takeaway is to know your who. Like us, you may not know your who at the beginning of the project, but that's okay. Avail yourself of all resources available to you to help, uh, to help learn more about your user population, and don't be afraid to drill down into specifics. At OCLC, we're fortunate to have an awesome UX team, but you can get to know your who even without dedicated UX resources to have, help you craft a formal user persona. Remember, the most important step towards building a persona is to talk to your who, actively seeking to improve your understanding of their tasks, goals, challenges, and pain points. If you do this, you're already on your way towards a better understanding of your, of your who. Next, make sure you're clear about your problem. Ask yourself these three questions. First, am I solving a problem? Second, what problem am I solving? And finally, does my who care about my problem? Taking the time to address these questions up front will pay huge dividends in the long run. You'll have much greater confidence in your solution and will help assure end user adoption. It also makes the scope of your project crystal clear and allows you to identify any dependencies that exist before you embark upon writing actual code. Finally, it's never too early to get feedback, and you'd be smart to start the process as, before you even touch code. As I mentioned, we began collecting feedback via focus groups, CI visits, and usability tests as early as the site mapping and wireframing stages. Tools like Axure that allow you to build interactive prototypes easily are also opening up new possibilities in terms of bringing users into the development process early on. So don't let the time commitment of doing this scare you because any time spent making sure that your project is on the right track from the get-go is time well invested. All right, and with that, I'm done and happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you. So up next is fellow 10-year Code for Liber, Andreas Ordre Orvanides, talking about systems thinking, a practical field guide. 
All right, let's see if we can um, make these slides go. All right, all right, can you see that? Uh, hey, look at that. Um, okay, so, hi, I'm Dre, um, Andreas Orphanides. Uh, this is, in fact, my attempt code for lib. Um, I tend to talk really fast when I'm uh, presenting, so if I start talking really fast and you can't understand, just shout really loud and I'll slow down. Um, also, if you want to follow along, my slides are in the uh, OSF Dropbox and they've got my notes and image descriptions and image credits in them. All right, so let me tell you the story of why I decided to do this talk today. Uh, so this is a story about bathrooms. Um, one day uh, I was at work and I was walking by one of the public restrooms and I got near the bathroom and I noticed this trail of little white bits of paper that were like leading in towards the bathroom door and so um, it had been tracked out into the lobby so I like followed the bits of paper into the bathroom because I was curious like a little trail of breadcrumbs um, and I found these pieces of paper towels that were just scattered all over the bathroom floor. I'm not sure if you can see them well with the contrast, but the floor has lots of little bits of paper towel over it. Um, so, oops, not what I wanted to do yet. Uh, so you might expect to see paper towel litter in a bathroom, because it's a bathroom, right? Uh, but these paper, bits of paper were everywhere, and they had a weirdly consistent size and shape that was much smaller than a full piece of paper. And so I was wondering, like, is there a particularly uh, meticulous vandal who's like carefully shredding up pieces of paper and scattering them on the floor? And so I wanted to look a little, uh, little more closely. Uh, one thing I noticed was that the scraps were mostly concentrated under the dispensers themselves, and they were mostly damp, um, which in itself isn't unusual for being on the floor of a bathroom, but they, there you go. Uh, and they also had this kind of roughly triangular shape with the sawtooth edge, and you might already recognize what these are from um, if you've ever used one of these paper towel dispensers before, right? So these paper towel dispensers are terrible because they have a horrible flaw, especially if you have really cheap paper towels in them. Uh, you're supposed to pull on the paper towel with both hands and on the corners, but and it pulls the thing out, and then the next paper towel slots into place and it cuts off the current one. But you know, your hands are wet and the paper towels are usually too thin. Um, and so you grab it and the paper towel gets weak and you pull the corners of the towel off, right? And so lots of people have done this. And so you got these little pieces of triangles of paper in your hand and so the frustrated people just flick them onto the floor, right? Um, and so that was what was going on in the bathroom. Uh, uh, so this has clearly happened to lots of people, and so, so I found myself starting to think about how this flaw came about in this system. So there's some intersection between wet hands and thin paper towels and a bad dispenser design and the bathroom being really high traffic. And so I was standing there and I was thinking, is it possible to fix one or more of these issues? And if we can't fix them, how do we mitigate them? And then I kind of got a hold of myself and realized that I was standing in the bathroom doing CSI bathroom edition, right? Um, and, 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 and so I, I collected myself and went about my business. Uh, so, so why am I telling this story? Uh, basically, I realized that, that all the time, every day, as I'm walking through the world, I'm doing systems analysis without really intending to. Uh, I like examine all these systems that I come across. It's like a systems daydreaming that I'm doing. I'm doing it all the time. And I, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that systems daydreaming is actually a good skill to have, because I'm essentially practicing the systems analysis that I do on the job just as I go about the world. And as I've said before in Code for Lib, systems analysis is our best technique for introspecting into our own work to understand how our systems succeed and fail. So I want to teach you all how to systems daydream. And that's why I'm up here today. All right. So here's an outline of how to do systems daydreaming for yourself. It's not comprehensive, but it should provide some strategies and a starting point for how to read systems in the wild world. Step one is knowing where to look. Um, you've got to, uh, you, you, you need to be able to detect when there's good systems analysis afoot. So here's a barrage of things I've systems daydreamed about, and I want you to look at them uh, and, 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 and feel your emotional reaction to these things. Uh, you might have seen some of them before in previous talks of mine. They might be familiar. That's okay. Just pay attention to your, your emotional response. So there's this building sign at NC State that just has numbers on it. Um, 
there's uh, the, the magic marker annotations that someone's written above this light switch panel. Um, there's the rechargeable Apple mouse that you have to flip over to recharge, right? Um, here's a sign on a bathroom door that says, please pull the door towards you slightly when locking or you may have unwanted visitors. Um, and here's this completely indecipherable parking pay station, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, so you can, you can tell there's good systems analysis hiding behind these uh, situations by the immediate gut reaction you have to these pictures. They may include feelings like confusion or frustration or surprise or delight or curiosity. What is it that these emotions have in common? They're all reactions to the unexpected. We expect systems to be controlled and engineered. Uh, so when something catches us by surprise in a system, it indicates that the system is behaving outside the locus of control that we expect it to have. So this suggests that there's something really wrong or maybe really clever going on with the system. So now that we've found a system that might be interesting, how do we look closer to figure out uh, what the, what's the next step in our analysis? Here's a partial list of things to look for to investigate further. First, there's wear patterns. Wear patterns are a natural occurrence when something gets used a lot, but they can tell us interesting things. So for instance, they can identify situations where extra force is needed. Uh, so here's a door that has a, a shoulder check pattern on it because it's too heavy to push, or to naturally push open easily with the handle. Um, they can also reveal differential patterns of use. So this is like a gate leg table, so those leaves fold down on the sides. And you can tell that this table was usually used with the leaves folded down because it's only worn in the middle. Uh, the apotheosis of differential wear is the desire path, right? Um, so this occurs when the, when the space design and the user experience are in disagreement. And so users just decide to create their own paths in defiance of the ones that were intended by the engineers. Um, wear patterns can also be revealed in the presence of transient materials like water or snow or dust or dirt. Uh, these snow patterns that you see here are called snack downs by uh, traffic engineers. And they can reveal elements of traffic engineering that have been over-designed uh, by demonstrating where traffic doesn't travel um, in the road as it was built. So that was one category. Our next category is breakdowns. Uh, breakdowns are bugs or features of a system that lead to some sort of failure. Now, if you have a Mac of a certain vintage, you're probably familiar with the breakdown in the MagSafe connectors. So they have this strain relief, but the strain relief doesn't really relieve strain. It just moves it down the cord a couple of millimeters. Um, and it, the effect is almost as if there was no strain relief there at all. Eventually, the cable just frays at that spot and breaks. And then you have to shell out like 70 bucks on a new MagSafe uh, charger. Um, design failures I would also count as breakdowns, so here's that, that mouse that you can't use while it's charging. Um, and breakdowns can also be purely conceptual, right? So it's like, uh, what is it, like, like 10.45 right now or something on a Wednesday? How long can you park? All right. If you want some real fun, I've, tr I've put a, a transcript of the entire sign in the speaker notes. It doesn't help. All right, so our next category is fixes. Uh, so when a component's modified to maintain or restore its functionality, that's a fix. So you've probably seen light switches where someone's like awkwardly taped the switch into place so you don't flip it or to prevent it getting flipped accidentally. So maybe it like turns off the dishwasher or shuts out the porch light or like kills the circuit where the router is plugged in or whatever, right? Um, you might have one of these switches in your very own house. Um, the currency of fixes is things like tape and zip ties and WD-40. Um, so here someone's replaced, uh, repaired a broken car door handle with a piece of dowel and some zip ties. Um, and fixes also include workarounds. <laughs> <laughs> So, so here's an example where presumably security was once required but is no longer. So rather than rip out the entire security system, which would have a really high cost, the most expedient and efficient solution is just to publish the code. Uh, so fixes often take the form of documentation and by, by filling in missing information in context to forestall a usability problem. So next category is hacks. 
Hacks is a pretty broad category, and it's basically any time something's modified from the baseline in order to pr improve the outcomes or to, or if the thing is used in a way that introduces capability outside of its original design. This is a little different from a fix in that we're trying to get results above or adjacent to what's expected rather than just fixing what we expect to be there in the first place. So here's a picture of a hammer that's been modified with a magnet at the end so you can uh, like pick up nails with the end and hold on to them while you're using the hammer. So haps, ha hacks often expose a gap between the needs identified during design and those that manifest in practice. At my vet's office, the vestibule door for some reason wasn't built with a propping mechanism, and so they've improvised one by using a leash and an eyelet. Um, because it's a vet's office, and they have leashes handy, I guess, right? Uh, incidentally, this kind of demonstrates that the line between fixes and hacks is a little blurry, because this could very well be a fix if it's a broken door kick, or it could be a hack if the door was never built with a door kick. Um, Clever tricks that prevent future breakdowns also we can count as hacks and uh, as seen on TV devices often fit into this category. If you can't really tell what's going on in this image, um, on the left there's a, a, a shower where the curtain rod has like damaged the wall and on the right there's this like acrylic thing that you can mount the shower curtain rod onto to prevent it from damaging the wall and keep it suspended in the um, uh, above the shower stall. Uh, the, the caveat with the as seen on TV products is that they don't really count as hacks if they don't work and, and we know how the track record is of as seen on TV stuff. Uh, hacks also include uh, so-called dark patterns which are design approaches that exploit cognitive biases to get users to act against their own interests. So here's a gas pump where the buttons are placed with the button for the most expensive grade on the far left where the cheapest grade usually is. In this case you probably want the middle button and not the left one but you instinctively might just go for the left one since it's on the left. And the last category we're going to look at is missing information. Uh, so when information is missing or omitted from a design, it suggests that there's a gap between, <laughs> between the information design and the information use. Sometimes this gap is intentional, as in this sign in a school cafeteria that bans Cheez-Its but judiciously avoids mentioning exactly why. Uh, missing information is often an indication of an unrecognized breakdown. So for years, the 110 freeway in Los Angeles caused confusion by failing to indicate where the exit for the 5 was going to be. Uh, and so in 2001, an artist named Richard Ankrum got fed up with the failure and just went out there and installed his own highway sign. Uh, missing information can also demonstrate a context gap between designers and users, as in the particularly unhelpful NC State campus sign. Um, and finally, and maybe most interestingly to me, missing information can also be used to communicate implicitly, especially with respect to social norms, which are similarly implicit. So at my local science museum, there's two gift shops, and one of them has this sign outside of it that says, groups welcome. Uh, the other gift shop doesn't say anything about groups one way or the other, but nevertheless, this sign manages to communicate expectations about the other gift shop. All right, so all of these features, wear, breakdown, fixes, hacks, missing information, they represent things like friction or competing goals or unacknowledged needs or information asymmetry in the system. In other words, they're indicative of tensions that exist within the system. And it's these tensions that will allow us to develop an understanding of how the system came to be in its current state. Now that we have identified those key points of tension, we can start working through the details. Um, at this point, we can hypothesize how the system developed, understand the needs of the system, how the needs of the system compete or, with or complement each other, and consider how uh, the system could be improved. Broadly speaking, we can do this by trying to understand the moving parts of the system, actors, workflows, resources. Uh, once we've got a sense of this, we can consider the goals of the system, uh, goals of the system players, and work backwards to understand how the identified tensions came about. Uh, sometimes our first glimpse of the system isn't enough for us to do that and we may have to wait for or seek out additional information about the system for things to click. At this point we may have to revise our model. Um, and once we've made sense of the system in its current state, now we have a chance to consider what improvements, if any, can be made. This step might not be relevant if you're examining an interesting but failure-free system. And incidentally, sometimes these steps happen a bit out of order, especially if you find that you need new information. Slow down, okay. Thank you, Ronti. 
Let's look at some examples. Okay, so uh, we'll start by revisiting our opening example. So first I identified components. There was the paper trash, uh, trying to understand who made it and why. Uh, this is essentially component identification. Uh, I stalled out a bit for a moment until I got more information by recognizing the role that the paper towel dispenser played. And this allowed me to reverse engineer the whole scenario. We've got university sanctioned toiletry vendors, there's inferior towels, it's a high traffic bathroom, and impatient students with wet hands. Now comes the opportunity to consider improvements. Our options are to fix the students, fix the dispensers, or fix the towels, or to come up with some partial solution. Changing student behavior is basically impossible, so that's out. Um, and as it turns out, the dispensers and the towels are managed at the campus level uh, for the whole university, which means that changing that would be a big costly fix, which is definitely outside of scope. But it would be really inexpensive to add a second waste bin below, the ta below this towel dispenser that didn't, didn't have one. This wouldn't solve the problem, but it would partially mitigate the symptoms and maybe reduce some of the tracking that I saw. So here's another example. So we see some interesting desire paths here, right? So this is a university campus. Uh, the key components are the students, the paths, the building, the university itself as an entity. The building has a door just at the left edge of the portico. Let's reverse engineer. So there's two desire paths that we see. An established one on the left and a newer one on the right. The one on the left was once a quick route to the entrance, but the university wanted to protect the lawn, and so they erected a fence to block the shortcut, right? This only caused the desire path to flow around to the next most accessible route, the path to the right. Some things to note about this situation. As far as the university is concerned, the fence is a fix, which is attempting to keep the lawn untrodden. Uh, to the people trying to get to the door, it's a breakdown because it interferes with their access path. Ultimately, the fence fails as a fix, but it still represents a breakdown to the users. What is there to be learned about this situation? Desire is like water. If you try to block it, it'll simply flow around. Instead of attempting to block the path, a better solution would be to create a sort of desire culvert by formalizing the immersion path through paving it or something like that. This would yield more control over the flow of people without trying to oppose it directly, and it would prevent further damage to the lawn, which the existing fix didn't do. And now, as promised in my abstract, we're gonna talk about burrito shops. Uh, my favorite burrito place in Raleigh-Durham area, which is where I'm from, is called Car Burritos. Um, because it's in Carboro, Carboro, yeah. Adam knows what I'm talking about. All right, so they make a good hefty burrito, as you can see here, and also, interestingly, they have two kinds of chips. They've got regular corn chips and they have all flour chips. The all flour chips are just fried tortillas and they're delicious. Um, and when you buy a burrito, you get a mix of the regular and the all flour chips, but you can also buy the two separately. And interestingly, when you buy the flour chips, they're a little more expensive than the regular chips. They're clearly made in-house, but I never really thought much about them. Until one day I was buying a burrito, and, and the guy pulled the first burrito wrapper off of the top of the pile. It's one of these big 12-inch burritos, right? And he looks at it, and it's got a tear or a hole in something, and he carefully sets it aside. And that little bit of information was enough new information for me to reverse, the ex reverse engineer the entire existence of all flour chips. <laughs> they weren't created just to provide a different, more expensive, tasty chip. They were a hack. All flour chips were created as a way to reduce losses due to variations in tortilla quality control. Uh, I'm guessing the original subpar, originally the subpar tortillas were just cut up and fried, the resulting chips were just tossed in with the regular ones, but they became so popular they made it a sideline of its own. This was the other experience that inspired the talk. I can't guarantee that my burrito reconstruction is true, but I was surprised that one little bit of information, the fact that reject tortillas are saved, allowed me to make a plausible hypothesis about the genesis of an entire system component. And now it's your turn to give it a shot in the real world. The next time you see some interesting aspect of a system and it catches you by surprise, try reading into it. What can you discover? What can you reasonably guess about its natural history? If the system isn't working as well as it could, what fixes are there? And what fixes most reasonable in context? 
making a practice of systems daydreaming will make you a better systems thinker, and I hope you'll give it a try. And that's all I've got. And also, I have bonus material in the slides if you want to practice on your own. There's a few more pictures. So take a look. One minute if someone has a question, or maybe two questions. There's one over here. Hi, um, I found your, your talk extremely interesting. Thanks. And um, I was just wondering, I mean, you said a lot. Uh, you could probably write a book on this subject. <laughs> um, if you wanted to sort of improve your, like as, as an individual, improve your way of thinking in terms of what you talked about, um, do you have any advice for like books or or any, any sort of outside resources? So my three go-tos for systems analysis are uh, Contextual Inquiry by Bayer and Holtzblatt, um, The Systems Bible by John Gall, and The Design of Everyday Things by uh, Don Norman. Just read those three, and that's probably plenty to get started if you haven't read them yet. More? We good? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dre. Up next, speaking of design, low-tech approach to beginning a redesign by Sarah Brenham. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, before I start, I wanna give a shout out to my imposter workshop from yesterday. I'm like 60% less nervous than I was yesterday. Um, so I'm Sarah Sheely Branham. I'm the senior web developer at Clemson University Libraries. And today I'm gonna talk about um, a low tech approach to beginning a redesign. So we launched our website about a year and a half ago and very few people liked our homepage. So we thought it would be a good time to make an update. Some of the complaints were too many words, too many links. Those colored boxes, I don't know if you can tell, are um, classifications of students, researchers, faculty and staff, and alumni and community. And a lot of people thought the division of roles was pretty arbitrary. And they said they couldn't find anything. A lot of the feedback was change everything. <laughs> so we came up with a few questions to start with. What links do we actually need and what don't we? What's the best way to remove the paragraphs of text under user divisions? Can people find what they need? And do students and others know what these links even are? We were unable to get any responses from staff or faculty except for one. And so uh, this is a known weakness, and I am working on a way to reach them inside and outside of the library. But I'll only be referring to students throughout this presentation. So why did we go low tech? There were four reasons. We don't have a UX budget. So any money I used came from everyone's library technology budget. Um, it's quicker than setting up and removing laptops in the room most likely to get the student's attention. We do not have a computer classroom right off the lobby, which is where I wanted to do this. And I didn't want to spend an hour setting up and removing laptops, which makes me sound lazy, but it was a consideration. Uh, it's easier to stand somewhere with a clipboard than a laptop. We don't have any tablets, so I would literally have to stand somewhere with a laptop if I wanted to ambush a student to ask them questions. And I needed back data to back up what I already thought. It's much easier to win over your stakeholders with numbers than just, I think this is how this is going to go. So our first test method was simply a screenshot printed out with a second sheet of paper that asked the students to do three things. Find the My Account button, find the hours, 
and where would they click, and tell us where they would click to begin researching a topic for a paper. I hope that this would answer the question, can people find important information? There was also an open-ended comment section where one of the pieces of feedback was, I dig it, thanks for the candy. And while that wasn't super helpful, it is to this day my favorite feedback I've ever received. So, our results from this was that my account was hard to find. Currently, it's up in the right-hand corner and students just did not look there. We, in the open-ended comment section, several people told us to move it to the menu area. Few students understood that our search box was universal, and they, so they had a lot of questions about how to find the information that they were looking for. And an overwhelming position, which we already knew, was that the homepage is way too wordy. And the students were unsure of the distinction between student and researcher categories. So the students thought, I'm researching a paper, therefore I am a researcher. Whereas the librarians making the website thought, graduate students doing their dissertations or outside researchers would use these links. So we realized that the My Account needs to be moved. We realized that the divisions are less clear than intended, and it's unclear to students what the search actually does. We needed to attempt to reduce the number of words, which I basically did by just removing the boxes altogether. There didn't seem to be a point to them. The next question was, what links on the home page need to remain during the revamp? Everyone wants their link on the home page. Everyone wants to be top of the list. No one uses this, but it has to be on the home page. And there are always going to be some links that admin requires you to have. There's not going to be any way to get around that. But for the rest of them, I wanted to be able to give hard data as to why we're doing things. So our second test method was card sorting. So that's just when participants sort out cards with topics or ideas into different categories. I used every link on the home page plus links I got from feedback from faculty and staff. And I used the categories important, kind of important, and not important at all. So I did three sets of 24 links, three category cards, and three test acre classifications, mostly just to break up the results. And I wrote them all with a Sharpie, and I gave myself a terrible headache. So I went into campus and I reserved the room directly next to the front entrance during the week before exams. I appropriated a movable whiteboard and borrowed some dry erase markers from the reference desk. And I created a beautiful sign that I wish I had taken a picture of, advertising that I had full size candy bars to give in exchange for a super short exercise. And I sat there for three hours three different times. And I made that sign really personal. The students didn't care to help make the website better. But if I wrote something like, help me get to lunch, or one more and I can go home, they actually identified with you know wanting lunch and not being able to have it, <laughs> even if they didn't know me from anyone else. Um, our results were pretty cool. We had 57 undergraduates eight graduate students, and one staff member who saw candy and wanted to have a Snickers bar. <laughs> um, and that's actually the most participation in any UX test that we have ever gotten, uh, even before my time, um, I've been told. Um, we, so we had 66 total, which was actually only limited because we only bought 66 candy bars. We actually ended up with more links rather than fewer links because I did the cutoff at 22 important ratings, which was one third of all respondents. Because I wanted to say, you know, a third of these people want this, and I feel like that is enough to justify its existence. One good thing was that we changed a lot of the links, we combined some links, 
we replaced a lot of links. So we actually only ended up adding a net total of two links. And several library links didn't make the cut with students, but that might change once I finally figure out how to get staff to give me feedback. Um, an unexpected benefit of this was that it created a list of links that was more easily divided between two categories. So we were able to sort them into find something and get help. And we also found out students don't know what course reserves mean. We still don't know what else to call it, so it's going to stay course reserves, but that was just an interesting tidbit that we found out. So what were the benefits of doing it this way instead of going ahead and, and paying for a service or something else? Um, it's cheap, the cost of printing, the Sharpie I already owned, $125 in candy, and I raided the closet for some note cards. Um, there's a quick turnaround. You can come up with the questions to be asked on like a Tuesday. You can write the cards or print the screenshot and reserve an area in the library or somewhere else that afternoon and do your testing on a Wednesday. There aren't any tech barriers. When I was in public libraries, I used to do UX testing where people would be like, well, I don't know how to use a mouse. And so that was a very real tech barrier. And with doing low tech stuff, anyone with any level of tech experience can participate. And also if the Wi-Fi goes down, you're still in business. It's a very easy way to answer specific and simple questions. And it also has given us a basis of where to start with redoing the homepage. Because now we know what information is needed, we know what is hard to find, and we have a bunch of comments gathered during the testing to allow us to gather ideas from those who actually use the site. And it also proves that user testing is important. It helped people at my institution realize that they didn't know quite as much about general opinion as they thought they did, which is something that I also do. And the next thing we would like to do is do the faculty and staff testing and actually getting me into the thing and setting up laptops, creating a test site for UX testing. And I want to use Google Analytics on every link to see if they're actually being used and see if there's a disconnect between, I think I want this and I actually need this. So I promise tips on getting a good turnout. And the number one thing is full-size candy bars. I cannot stress this enough. The, or bags of Skittles, you know, change it up for them. They, not everybody wants chocolate. But uh, several people said, I love this incentive, not that with those words. But I don't want to go stand in the Starbucks line with a $5 gift card for the next hour. I want to go ahead and eat the candy, get the sugar, and be done with it. So it was just very easy for them to be rewarded. Set yourself up in a highly visible area. I was literally next to the front doors. They had to pass by my sign to get into the building. And do it during exam time, which sounds counterintuitive, but I had a lot of students look at my sign, walk away, and then come back in an hour because they wanted a five minute break from studying for an exam. Or they would go to their exam and come back and have this candy bar waiting for them. Um, so definitely advertise that. And make sure you tell them it's short. They don't want to spend an hour. And if they know from the get-go that it's going to be three minutes, they uh, respond a lot better. And also try to have a visual outside that's larger than a like 8 by 11 poster. Um, and that can be hard if you don't have rolling whiteboards. But uh, it caught a lot of attention. I apparently talked really fast because it's only been 12 and a half minutes. But that's my presentation. <laughs> um, I'm always around. I'm on Twitter. This is my email. I'm in the Slack channel, I'm S. Branham. And those are my cats. I promised those to my workshop people. The big one is Lori, and the little one is Tao. So thank you very much. Questions? Uh, 
Uh, hi, I'm Emily. So you mentioned that students didn't know what um, course reserves were. And I yes. was wondering if you could speak more about how you collected data about um, categories or labels that might have been confusing or misinterpreted by students and how you adjusted accordingly. It was really, it wasn't a f sole focus, so it was mostly just um, anecdotal. Everyone was like, what does course reserves mean? And so I would make a note that the student also didn't know and I'd make hashtags. Um, I mean, hash marks, not hashtags. Uh, but I think that doing something, I could have asked follow-up questions and that's probably a good thing to look into <laughs> actually. Um, but most of it was just, I don't know what this is. And then I would explain it and they'd be like, oh, that's when my professor tells me that there's something behind the desk for us. So that's how I knew that they didn't know what it was. Mike. Just a word of warning about faculty and staff. They want completely different things. I used to work for a university at like the higher level and it was actually stuff like university development and that sort of stuff that they forced us to put on the homepage. Mm -hmm. um, but we ended up going with, you know, if you're a student, click here. If you're staff, click here. And, and different priorities for each of the groups. Thank you. Oh, can, you speak, can you speak to the difference between the people who come in versus the people who use the website? Is there any way to know that, you know, the subset of users I mean, maybe they aren't exactly overlapping and maybe they have different needs. We did create a online um, card sorting for, we have a bunch of distance users, uh, edu distance education students, and I did send that out to them. I got very few replies, so I'm not entirely sure how to reach them yet. But there will definitely be, I'm sure, a lot of different information from them. Okay, thank you. All right, up next is For Beginners, No Experience Necessary by Julie C. Swercheck. All right, hello everybody. So libraries are at the forefront of introducing people to technology, especially how to code. Whether we are teaching students, the general public, or our colleagues, we seem to get stuck in the same trap repeatedly. I get it, I really do. We want to be welcoming to all people, and that is truly noble. But we do everyone a disservice when we advertise a workshop as being for beginners with no experience necessary, because beginners come in all varieties. Oh yes, there will be animals. And foul language, get it? Foul language, get it? Yeah, 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 okay. A friend recently returned from a cruise where other travelers asked for his help using a computer. The first thing he had to teach them was to turn the mouse over. Those people were beginners, but I don't think I want them in my command line workshop. I've seen too many instructors spend two minutes demonstrating a for loop in Python and then ask the attendees as the next logical step in the learning process to build dice of doom in Lisp. No, just no. And we've probably all been in that workshop where attendees are told to bring a PC and there's that person who shows up with an iPad and doesn't understand why this is a problem. While we snicker about this, I submit that we are the ones who are being stupid here. Obviously, we didn't make the requirements clear to the beginners. 
The problem here is bad teaching and bad instructional design, not clueless beginners. Beginners are the absolute worst group of people for figuring out if they are skilled enough to sign up for your workshop because beginners do not know what they do not know. I've had some perfectly awful learning experiences, so I have some advice. First, decide what sort of beginners you want in the workshop. Should they know how to use a mouse, formulas in Excel, GitHub? Once you have an audience in mind, you have to help the beginners answer the question, is this workshop for me? Explain what foundational knowledge or analogous experiences they need to have to participate. Even better is to ask them to do something before signing up for the workshop. Ask them to run a program and submit the result on the registration form. Or direct them to an introductory exercise so they can decide if they should sign up. If they can't do it, then maybe these are not the droids you're looking for. Next, always make sure the attendees learn at least one easy thing to take away. That way, even if they feel lost for the rest of the workshop, they have one learning victory for the day. Pay attention to hospitality to help put people at ease. This includes things such as power outlets and Wi-Fi. I shouldn't even need to have to say that. Bathrooms, water fountains, food and drinks. Have a sense of humor. Model the attitude you want the beginners to have. If you come across as a perfectionist martinet, they are going to be scared to ask questions or learn from mistakes. One of the most important things about teaching beginners is therapy. I find the biggest part of teaching technology, especially to adults, is really mostly a form of therapy. And sales. I mean that in the best sense. You need to be able to show the audience that they have a need and this technology will help them fill that need. You have to explain to them how this will make their work more efficient or how they will be smarter and happier because of it. This is especially important when the beginners are reluctant colleagues. I have learned a few key phrases while teaching colleagues. It's not you, it's the software. And I don't think it makes any sense either. Really, it's not you, it's the software. My first law of computing is if someone claims that an interface is intuitive, then it is the best example in the universe of bad interface design. Intuitive my ass. It's not you, it's the software. Teaching beginners comes with a huge chunk of emotional labor. You can't say, I don't do emotional labor. As Adam Conrad says, being an ass does not recursively excuse you from being an ass. If you honestly feel that you are the exception, then you don't get to teach beginners. This kid is my spirit animal. Other things I've learned. The thrash method of figuring something out by mashing buttons usually breaks more stuff than it fixes in early learning. Don't go there. While working at something until you have a breakthrough can be a great learning experience, leaving beginners frustrated for too long makes them give up. Without reason, people are ashamed at their lack of understanding about technology and they don't want to reveal to their peers that they don't get it. To put them at ease, tell them about a learning block you have experienced. Hello, my name is Julie, and it took me weeks at my new job to figure out that the reason my programs kept crashing overnight was that my computer was plugged into an outlet that was shut off at night. <laughs> Remember what it is like not to know this stuff and how it felt when you learned it the first time. If you think, yeah, it was really hard when I learned this, so it's gonna be hard for other people and they just have to cope, you are a jerk and you don't get to teach beginners. If students need to set up special environment or software in advance, explain why and give them a method to test it so they can be sure it is working. If they might possibly need admin privileges, say so. Explain why and what that means and how to check. 
as an aside, give people who want to have an actual freaking career in libraries admin privileges to their computers. This is not open to debate. Beware showing up with the laptop of the glowing apple, especially when teaching the public. It fairly screams you have to be this wealthy to play. My first two computers came out of dumpsters. Teaching on a laptop rescued from a dumpster is the new black. Related, stop casting aspersions on other people's operating systems. So often we do not have a choice. My second law of computing is, if you change the code the night before the workshop, you will break it. Don't do it. Never say something is easy. Beginners already feel stupid because they don't understand it. If you say it is easy, now they feel even more stupid because they don't understand it and it is easy. Build pauses into the workshop. If you have to cut the content by half to give them more time, do it. Have attendees introduce themselves to their neighbors, encourage them to work together, and peer at each other's work if they need help. The first step in learning to code in a workshop should be studying programs. Then you can tell people to try to write them on their own. Related to that, to hell with elegance or doing things in the fewest possible lines of code. Beginners need to see everything spelled out. It's easier for them to read and write code that way. They can learn elegance later. A word to attendees. If you are bored because the workshop is too easy, then maybe you could spend the time honing your skills at assisting others. Don't try to steer the workshop in another direction. If everyone else is still struggling with the while loop and you bring up the Schwartz-Zippel lemma for polynomial identity testing, you are humble bragging and you are embarrassing yourself. To my fellow beginners, don't be afraid to learn from Scratch or Blockly. I learned more about programming in an afternoon with Scratch than I did in a semester of Python and I didn't throw any textbooks while using Scratch either. It's hard to learn a new program or how to code. We don't have to make it harder. We rarely are teaching the sort of courses for true beginners who have absolutely no experience. We have certain types of beginners in mind and the beginners can't know if they are the right sort of beginners unless we tell them. We need to be better at explaining who a workshop is for, and then we need to be better at teaching beginners. Let's do this. And if you want to know more about teaching beginners, come talk to me. Thank you. So I'm going to make a recommendation to the next LPC committee for next year's conference for, for pre-conferences. Can we have that required viewing for all pre-conferences and future pre-conferences who, who, for, for folks teaching them? Thank you. All right, so up next is Whitney Watkins and Kenneth Rose on dealing with technical debt, a point of view, DevOps, and, op and managerial. Thank you, Becky. Wow, that's, that's a presentation to follow. I won't be as, as exuberant, but yeah. <laughs> that's okay. We're kind of talking about a painful topic. Um, dealing with technical debt. Just a quick glossary of terms. Um, 
because it kind of technical debt and DevOps, what I'm going to talk about, mean things to different people. So I'm just going to kind of give a general um, technical debt used to relay what happens when rather than following like best practices or doing something the best way, you do the quick fix because emergency takes over rather than um, taking the time to do it. And then DevOps, the practice um, of operations and development engineers participating together in the entire service life cycle. So design through development and working together and using the same uh, methods and standards of practice in doing so. So um, the Project Management Institute defines a project as a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or result. Projects are typically outside of the, the norm of your ordinary day-to-day -day duties. They usually have a fixed start date and finish date, and many pro um, projects in IT transition into ongoing services moving forward. The triple constraint in project management refers to the competing demands of project scope, time, and costs, any of which go off, uh, off the plan could lead to accumulation of technical debt. So starting from the DevOps standpoint, um, my experience is going to be on system and application integrity, what I'm going to talk about um, in, in that regard, not so much on on hard coding, uh, more on, again, the DevOps side. Uh, and this is uh, sparked by having experience of taking on jobs that have had lots of inherited technical debt, and I've had to kind of clean up the pile and went from being very frustrating to, okay, I need to figure out a process so this isn't making me rip my hair out all the time. When you think about debt in any form, um, whether it's technical debt or actual you know, monetary debt, it, you, if you want to get rid of it, um, it's going to take time. It's going to be pretty painful, um, but you also need to know what you have before you can do anything about it. So make the definition of what technical debt is for you um, and your team, and then take an inventory on exactly what you have. So real life example, recently, about a, about a year ago, um, we had to, uh, was slotted to implement SSO into several of our applications and we do that in-house. We have the data provider in, in um, and going through that process realized that applications were out of date, so they needed to be updated, but in order to update them, we had to update frameworks, so like our PHP framework, and in order to update that, we had to update our operator from Red Hat 5 to Red Hat 6, which resulted in a huge jump and a complete migration. Um, so one not simple project, but project that shouldn't have been as in, uh, frustrating as it was turned into this ginormous mess. Um, it should not be that painful ever when you want to put something, uh, upgrade something or put a new feature in place. Before you can take an active in inventory, as I said, you need to define what counts as technical debt. Um, when we were assessing our system ac ac architecture and the application's technical debt, uh, really we were looking at what wasn't up to date. I took on a job that nobody had been in for a year, so things were more or less just trying to stay afloat. So looking at that, um, we also were able to determine applications that, oh, by the way, we're not going to be maintaining that or supporting it anymore, so we didn't need to put an effort into bringing that up to uh, uh, the updates in and making sure the patches were in place. Tech, and then we also had the, de basically the definition resulted down to um, in-house hacks to get something to work the way we needed it to. Uh, I, my predecessor was huge on JavaScript and wrote lots and lots of custom code for just about every application we had to do things that that application could do, but they didn't want to take the time to figure out how to do it right within the application framework, so they just wrote a hack to make it work. And those are hard to maintain when documentation doesn't um, sit with them. You don't know exactly what is all relying on it. Um, so we kind of started with a very broad definition and then narrowed that down and adjusted accordingly as we kind of went through everything. Uh, I really want to emphasize asking yourself as you're making this definition why you should do anything about it. Um, asking the why helps create the focus and the priority and to also eliminate too much scope creep if you have, if you learn to find that you have a ton of technical debt um, because then your backlog gets so big you kind of don't do anything to it because it's just too overwhelming. Uh, develop a plan as you are 
now you know what you have. Now you got to figure out how to fix it. Uh, prioritize, prioritize your payoffs. Pick the technical battles uh, carefully. Um, decide which bits need to be addressed now, which ones can be addressed later. And plan when you're going to work on them. I think we spend a lot of time defining it. Like, we spent a lot of time defining it and being like, all right, here's, here's our, our baggage, and not a lot of time on actually setting aside the time to do something about it. Uh, so do that as you're, you're in this process. A uh, really important part of dealing with debt is also giving ownership. Um, like me, because my predecessor and I had so much, I trying to determine who needed to own what. Um, we had a lot of turnover, people changing jobs, so we just went back to it, and I was like, all right, let's reassign who's gonna be over these parts. That's gonna help us later down the road um, when we need to do some gardening on, on our, our systems. It gets overlooked, and I think it's really important. So make sure you're asking why. Uh, I mentioned gardening. Uh, gardening is tidying up, tidying up things in projects sooner rather than later, just like a normal garden. Uh, pulling out weeds. It's general maintenance tax that can, tasks that can be done to improve code, the systems, etc., cetera, um, rather than putting them on the low, pri low priority to-do list. And then um, documentation or, or putting a standard, like we've got best practices on how to do it right the first time, but if you don't get that opportunity, you also need to have be best practices and standards in place when you have to take a shortcut. It, it, it's super important and it's incredibly helpful. My favorite approach is the why and approach, um, why we took the shortcut and what we need to do to fix it down the road. Uh, we also include like a short phrase in when we have to put like comments in code that we have to make take shortcuts on um, or in documentation that code exists so we can do quick searches and runs on them, whether it's you know using grep and awk or actually doing a search on our documentation. If for me, uh, I guess I can equate it to, I uh, worked in a system where we had a lot of 9, 10 notes for certain collections and when people needed stats on what do we have in this collection, we'd run, a, run on that phrase in that 9, 10. We do the same thing because it's a whole lot easier um, just to see where everything's coming from when we decide to check, have determined when we're gonna check back in. Uh, so that's kind of a nice little shortcut that, that I use and like to use. Take the time to identify your technical debt. Um, like truly think about it and act slower than you think, um, or yeah. Yeah, I guess act slower than you think. So leave room for growth and, and then just make sure you're gardening. Sometimes, as I mentioned, you don't get the time to influence something or fix something the best way you can because urgency or expediency outweighs doing it right the first time. Um, as I said, that's why having best practices in place will help. Before you take on new debt, as if you've cleaned everything up and now you've got to assess whether you're going to take the shortcut or if you really need to implement, uh, take the time and do it right the first time, ask yourself, do we have estimates for the debt and non-debt options? You know, if we take the shortcut down the road, what are we going to have to deal with later? Would it just be better to do it now? Um, do it the right way now. How much will the quick and dirty option cost, whether it's man hours or actual monetary? And then what are the cleanup options? Um, how much is that gonna take? Um, why do we believe that it is better to incur um, the effort later and take the shortcut now um, than to do the effort now? I think that's a question that is really important to be asked um, both by those doing the shortcuts and those demanding the shortcuts or the urgency. Um, and then what is expected to change to make taking on that effort uh, easier in the future, especially if it's um, going to be kind of painful. Um, and then, again, who's going to own the debt? I'm all about accountability, and I think uh, too many times I have ran into situations, I'm like, well, who did this? And they're like, ah, I don't know, or who's going to maintain this? Nobody really steps up to it and so assign ownership and make sure you know who's on what and that's documented and that the documentation is accessible and done um, in tools that you're comfortable with it doesn't need to be the new shiny stuff it can just you know merely be whatever you're comfortable using and that people uh, your team has access to and then my final thought uh, commonly referred to as the boy scout rule when you have to take um, do any sort of projects, whether you're taking it on or creating a new one um, or you're moving from a team, uh, is just do your best to leave it behind better than when you got it. If you had a blank slate, do your best that the person who inherits knows what they're getting 
or at least knows the shortcuts you took and, and why you took them. So um, I will be speaking about technical debt in the context of our current implementation of our new integrated library system. I became project manager at Carnegie Mellon in August of last year, and my first assignment was to roll out a new integrated library system. So I'd like to thank them for giving me the low-hanging fruit to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness. Um, one of the most important things I found out very quickly is when you enter into an endeavor like this, you have to identify your internal and external business partners almost immediately. You need to start that engagement as early as possible, and you need to start aligning your timelines with your business partners' timelines. Um, one one uh, thing I found out was um, I started to talk to the CIS group, start talking to business operations, start talking to the bursar, and I'm telling them about this project. We need to interface with your systems. We need to set up integrations. Um, I walked in there thinking, like, they will drop whatever they're doing and help me out. I felt like I was the sun and they were the planets, and I walked out feeling like Pluto. <laughs> How I, to, but to be clear, these are very good people, and we were able to work together to um, get together our timelines and move forward. But if you're in, in, involved in an endeavor of this magnitude, start early, start engaging with your business partners, identify whoever you need to talk to, and start align, aligning your timelines. You will be very happy you did that because Go live comes faster than you think. Um, so one of the things we had to do was, uh, and like I mentioned, engage with the sys group and engage with HR for the user feeds. One of the biggest integrations you're going to have when you move to a new library, uh, um, integrated library system. So we had a WebEx set up with, for both groups, and it was going really well. I mean. We were through almost through the whole meeting. Um, we were on our side, on the library side, we were really excited that these groups are going to be able to help us and help us move forward with these integrations. And then at the very end of the call, I, was, I made the wise decision to just sort of in passing say, uh, we'll be passing the documentation, um, the vendor documentation, so that you can go ahead and format these files in the, in the format that's required by our vendor. And they said, what? And I was like, well, you're going to be providing us the data. It just needs to be in a certain format, and we were hoping you'd take care of that. I said, well, no, we can't do that. You can, we'll provide it in the format that we have, and you can take care of that. So the point is, define the division of labor with your business partners as well, especially if you have limited resources in your group. Um, we are not a big team. We have two developers, and then we found out after this engagement that all of this work to get these um, user feeds in the correct format for our vendor needs to be done on our end. So that sort of goes along with what I said before. Aligning your timelines, um, identifying who you need to work with, but also defining the division of labor between your group and your business partner's group. Um, also in our case, in the context of the implementation, of the integrated library system. You have to eng uh, engage with external business partners such as Elite, OCLC, Relay, and database vendors such as uh, EBSCO or whoever. Um, start talking to those folks early and often and make sure you're on the same page and that there's nothing that's going to happen, no surprises that are going to happen that could affect your go live date. Another thing you want to do is manage the scope of these integrations. Um, start to define what needs to be ready to go at go live. You want to hit the ground running on, on certain things for sure. There are things you're going to have to be able to do day one, but are there integrations that can happen a little bit later? Because you, what you don't want to do is get into a situation where you go ahead and try to do every integration to the, to, to the most extreme um, extent and then realize that you had to cut corners to meet the go live deadline. So there are things that can wait until after go live. For, for instance, our go live is March 13th, but even after go live, we are still in the migration phase of the implementation for a month. So we decided to prioritize our integrations. We know we got to get SIS going. We know we got to have some level of integration with business operations, some level of integration with the bursar. But 
uh, we can do further integrations as we move forward. We can integrate with more third-party systems, maybe a, um, an institutional repository or whatever it may be. But define and manage the scope of these integrations because if you go ahead and rush it, so like Whitney said, you cut corners, you're going to accumulate technical debt and you're going to pay dearly for it later. Uh, yeah, this is, um, I think this is huge right here. Um, design a risk management plan. And um, having a risk management plan can mitigate, mitigate excuse me, the accumulation of technical debt and help maintain your triple constraint of cost, time, and scope. Um, this plan should be proactive in its nature. Um, it should be taken upon at the beginning of the project itself. So for instance, um, you will go into any project knowing that one common risk may be employee turnover. You know that people who are on your project team may have, maybe they move on to a better opportunity, maybe God forbid they get sick, or something happens where they can't be there for the duration of the project. One of the things you can do is set up your project team from the beginning such that you can withstand this sort of unexpected turnover. So in our case, what we did was we populated the team with redundancy in all the functional areas. So for circulation slash fulfillment, we had multiple people, a couple people. For cataloging, we had a couple people. Um, for acquisitions, we have a couple people on the project team. So it's not just one person that you're, we're completely relying upon as part of the project team. And we even have redundant leadership. Although I'm project manager, we also have two project co-chairs so that if God forbid something happens to me on my train ride back home, somebody else can step in, keep the project moving forward. So um, it's sort of proactive. The risk management plan is proactive in the sense that you already anticipate from the very beginning what could possibly go wrong, and you go ahead and design things to address it at the beginning. So it's proactive and reactive in that you put that in place so that you have redundancy in the functional areas on your project team, but also if somebody were to leave, you, you're, you can completely move forward and hopefully not skip a beat, hopefully not accumulate technical debt in that regard. And with that, it seems a real, uh, really abrupt. We said we will wing this. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> I told you. I told you. Two minutes. Questions? It was One perfect. Right over there. Oh. <laughs> oh. In the room, yeah. I guess left, right stage. Yeah. Almost. Hi. How do you handle like territorial resistance to redundant declaring redundancy in people? You know, actually we haven't had to run into that. Um, there is enough work with this sort of migration that we're doing that no toes are being stepped on. People are working together. People, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's really a great group. And I'm not just saying that because they're probably watching right now. I really, <laughs> I, I mean that. And there, we've, I've not run into that issue, not even one little bit. It seems like you have this from like a, a it's cultural from the top down of the team as well. And if you show that you're open to doing it for your own position, and I think that creates a good environment for others to follow along. So I'm really happy to see that you have done that across the board and your team. Yeah, and I think another part of it which helps is people were excited to be moving to a new system. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they want to improve their workflow efficiently, efficiencies. They want to streamline their processes. They want to do things in a cleaner, more efficient manner. And that really helped in getting everybody on board with wanting to move forward with this project. Well, thank you. All right. One more talk before lunch. So pay attention because you're going to be learning about building a cloud platform using AWS for data anal analysis of digital library by Yinlin Yin Yin Chen.
Hi everyone, uh, Yiling Chen here from Wenjia Tech Libraries. And uh, today uh, in this presentation, I'm talking about share our experience on building a data analyzed platform on the cloud using AWS. So we first will talk about current library service using in this data analyzed platform and uh, talk about how our architectural decision and the considerations and how we use the AWS and how what we learn from this process and share our best practice of this and uh, finally our future work. So current uh, in the Virginia Tech libraries we have several service and uh, in here just these two. So one we have uh, VTech data is increment using uh, Sophia and uh, Big M Fedora. It's basically is a service for you to upload uh, the collections such as research content for faculty or student, upload their papers or something or research data, videos in this service. And another is VTech works. Is using this space built on top of this space. So every student after they finish their final defense and uh, they upload their dissertation into this, this distance. So currently we have uh, maybe over 30,000 dissertation in these libraries. So what we have in these two services, First, we have log data. Of course, we have uh, application log. We have web log. So also we have uh, content, collection content, uh, ETD, dissertations, and also research content. So why we need the data analysis platform? So there are two different perspectives. So one is the log analysis. So we want to know the after we build the service, we want to know quite the system actually work. And uh, if we have some problems, we need to look at log and find uh, identify the issues. And also want to see the logs, do some analysis to find the patent. And basically we want to know the quite the application normal behavior and also un unusual behavior so we can prevent in case there's a failure in the future. And uh, in here, just this some of the uh, use case. Another part is the content analysis. So we have a lot of collections. We have research papers or something. So we can do many things, such as we want to know what topic for last year or quite the current trends. And also because uh, people make mistakes. So when they update, their collections, they create their own metadata. They may be some bad format or missing character or something or record issues. We need to identify them and uh, in order to perform, uh, create this record in order to bet, make better service. So we want to, want to know them. And also we want to know what the usage status of this content. For example, so each year maybe your library purchased a lot of uh, papers and how does your faculty or student use them? You need the data to know is it worth to spend that money to acquire that research content. So we need a platform. So on the top side is just a web log. So it's pretty ugly and nobody will see that, right? So we want to see, not from the top, we want to see the bottom one. So we can see the usual behavior or maybe something wrong during a certain amount of time, certain period of times. And also, regards to content, we collect a lot of metadata. So look at the left, but no one wants to see this metadata. We want to visualize that. We want to see the category, which category most interesting to users. And the quite is my, Current content contain what in what is machine learning or is something others. 
So this is a ba very basic data analysis pipeline. So we need to first need to collect our data regards to uh, log data or content. And then we need to find a place to store this content. And further, we need to process this content or do analyze. Finally, we can create a visualization of our data to create a value so we can publish our, our finding, our patent, our usage to others and share to others. So building a payphone, uh, of course, including a lot of different kinds of decisions. So first, we don't want to build, already, build some tools already there. We can just use them. And uh, with certain thing is, so when we have an idea, we want to just try it and uh, see how it looks. So we need to build a prototype. If it's good, we shift to production. And uh, the other one is not a maintenance need. So create a new thing is exciting, but maintenance is, uh, right? So if we don't need to maintenance, that's good. And also in order to achieve that, the whole infrastructure need to be able to programmable, automatable, or, and further you can optimize it. So you can easy to recreate, and can, you can also easy to extend it and make it more better. And then finally, optimization, including performance, also the cost. The final is the learning curve, so a lot of platform out there. So based on, it, uh, if you need to based on your base, uh, experience and knowledge, so choose the platform really easy for you to learn, to use, and you can create them. So in the architectural decisions, so it's a very high level concept, so it's just agile, so you can build a, merge a components very easily and the extent. And of course, you need to be stable and scalable. So based on the size of your creations, you get able to scale and the stand, stand, stability. So you able to extend, create new service plug in all new service, other new service. And of course, you need to think about security because some of the data is contain sensitive information. You need to make sure of this. And also, each operation in the system, you need to able to be adaptable. And also, the final is cost. Cost it matters. And also, the platform you can so you can think of, because different, depending on your size, right? The size can be just 100, 100 to 10,000, maybe 1 billion, and uh, maybe 100 million. So you able to, you try to build a system you know, able to handle this amount of the data. And also, in here, we are not talking about the collection, you, the service, you store these kind of collections. We're talking about, it's for example, if you have 10,000 data, so how many web log will create in a day? So if you have one million collections, how many web log or application log we will get on a day? Maybe more than one million. And also story size in here, you need to think about, so when we do containerize, you use something like machine learning or deep learning, you need to build, build a model or simply you want to build a DA to find a topic. The analyze will create a new data. So depending on your size, you will create more data. So you need a lot of storage to store this analyze content. So your system need to be able to handle this amount of size. And also uh, your application be able to start from simple. So build from the prototype. So maybe from the beginning, you just use a couple service. And then you're able to make more complicated in order to handle more different situation based on your use case. So right now we talk about log analyze. So currently there are several open source 
like the ELG, ELK, EKK. So basically, um, they use the data search, and the log stage is uh, is an open source tool can ship your application log, uh, server log into somewhere, and uh, basically they just in ship your log into the elect search, and uh, finally they use the open source tool like uh, the first one is Graphia or something or and also gray logs, so you can visualize the endless output from the elect search. And also, there are another open source called Kabana. It's also another visualizing tools. You can present your next data in a virtual way. And the third one is uh, AWS solutions. So they have uh, AWS elect search combined with the Kinesis this is a service with uh, three different components. They look, they, one of the components, just like log stage, they can ship your log into a data search. And uh, inside the data search, they have component to visualize your result. So in AW Kinesis service, they have three components. One is called string, and then another is file host, and the third one is analyze. The first one is streaming, just like the log stage can collect your data from your server and uh, upload to AWS service. Not only to Elasticsearch, search, also you can ship to AWS 3, which is the uh, storage. And also there's a file host, you can do batch, you can ship your data in S3. And uh, the third one analyze is like uh, query platform, you can use the uh, SQL query query language to query your data. So, so AWS is a very big platform, so they contain a lot of services. So in, in each state, so for example, each in the collections, they provide different kind of service. So like on this slide, storage, they have different kind of service you can store your data. And also process visualizations. So based on your need, based on your family with this, with this service or not, you, and also the cost, you decide which service you want to use and in order to build your platform. So, so this is what we're building here. So we start small, so we just pretty straightforward. We have data source from our servers and uh, we strip our log data, web log data and research content into the storage AWS S3 is a object store storage. And after we have all our data in a, uh, S3, we can integrate AWS service to do many things. So one of the thing here is using AWS Elective Search. So we pass our logs and pass our stem, our content, and uh, translate into a JSON format and uh, ingest into data search. And uh, finally, we integrate with uh, Kabana, so library, librarians can use, use these tools to create the visualizations for off layer data. So from here, we build a prototype, and we think it's good, so we include more service. So out, out here, I just make a general in intro of this service. So first one is just storage. And uh, the second one is a lambda. Lambda is a function. It's a call function. So you don't need a server. And uh, you just have implement your function. And uh, they will receive your orders and uh, do something. And uh, the search and command. And also uh, config. So you want to, when you build a, uh, a platform, you need to log everything. So this service log all your configurations in AWS, and then they provide a, re, uh, a history. So you can, if you do something better or something wrong, you can just switch. They have different version, you can switch anytime. And also uh, AWS uh, SNS is a notification system, just uh, you, like a subscribe. You can subscribe and receive. And IAN is uh, access control. And also call watch, you want to see how your uh, platform uh, 
uh, how many they handle requests. If Cloud Watch provide a ma different metrics, you can watch how your system works. And also cultural, you need to, this service for you to see all the API code from the ADA, inside the AWS. And the uh, last one, VPC is a virtual private cloud. It's just uh, because inside the AWS is, is a virtual private cloud is something like for un service under the firewall. So you can control your component service inside that in order to provide more securities. So from the collection store, so in AWS 3, when we ship all our content to S3, so the content may be small or large. So some best practice, so the large S3 object is five terabyte. And uh, you can upload a single file is in the single put just five gigabyte. So best practice, if you, your file size is more than 100 megabyte, you better use multi-path multi upload in order to use your bandwidth to upload this kind, this, this size of the data. And uh, this is the uh, interface of uh, AWS Lambda. So you can integrate, you can call your, implement your Lambda. So for, take this for example from S3, this, if a file upload into S3, trigger a Lambda, and the Lambda will pass the content and the ingest into the Amazon Elastic Search. So when we see the log, the uh, top part, the top, the up part is the uh, web log, right? So when we upload the log into S3, and uh, the S3 will trigger the Lambda function, and uh, the later Lambda function will pass the content, the top pump, top content, and then translate into a JSON files, and then use this content ingest to the data search. So you, inside the Lambda, you can use Python or Node.js. So depending on which programming language you think it's it's pretty easy to implement, and uh, it's just a sample. So data search provides is a full text search just as solar, and it's a management service, so we don't need to log into a server and start download the software and compile by yourself. You can just use this service. And uh, when you choose the in AWS, because there are many kind besides service, you also need to know the size. And you can choose different kind of instance types. So if was, for example, uh, if you choose small size, maybe just gigabyte or terabyte. And also, you different size support different HTTP request payload, such as small size just support 10 megabyte, bigger image provide 100 megabyte. So base practice is, is uh, you need to double your index size and uh, use three detail master node for productions and uh, enable long awareness to improve the high abilities and uh, set your cache size to 40 is a common use case just for uh, Java virtual machine, virtual memories. And uh, in AWS, you use, use CLI, so you can easily use the command line tools to change your node, change your size. So finally, you can use this tool to, to create the visualize, to create the value of your content, your, your collections. And then finally, you can include more service. So for this, you can service use SNS trigger lambda, create a service, and also you need to set control and monitor your service, how it works. And the uh, best practice and design pattern, you, so decouple the modules, use many systems, use the right tools, right instance. And uh, also you think about, after you build the platform, you think about resilience, automatic operation, especially the cost. And uh, so our next step is building a machine learning with our logs. So we want to use the machine to predict what the, um, Unnormal behaviors to prevent 
to make our system better. So you can, based on the data in the S3, build the model, do a prediction. And also, other cover will do. So quite a percent in here using AWS. You, of course, you can use in such as Google Cloud. They pretty much the same, just different names. You can build it. So that's it. Thank you. That's fine. Yeah, I'm good. Give it up for the first round of speakers on the first day of Kofalo. <laughs> Before I release the masses onto food and more caffeine, I have several announcements. First announcement. You know those lanyards I was talking about this morning? They are here. So if you have a black lanyard, feel free to trade that in for a green, yellow, or red lanyard at the registration desk, which is downstairs this time around. For those of you who were asking about lightning talks, our five minute, talk, five minute um, talks that you can talk about anything that you want, uh, Sign-ups for this afternoon's lightning talks are open at the registration desk. And for breakout sessions, 45-minute, essentially, on-conference birds of a feather, small group discussions, we also have those sign-ups sign open for them. And if you're doing a lightning talk, if you're going to do slides, please go to the speaker FAQ on the uh, website to go learn about what the slide uh, format is supposed to be and for accessibility, making sure that your slides are accessible. And if you are a speaker for this afternoon, please load your presentation onto the laptop right up here. And for that, thank you and go forth and lunch. <laughs>